Regent McMillan, the video is live. Please proceed. Thank you, Jason. I call to order this meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota's Board of Regents. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to those who are joining us via the live stream video today. We are meeting virtually and want to remind everyone that the Minnesota Open Meeting Law provisions allow us to conduct meetings via electronic means in situations like this. A very quick refresher on our protocol for this meeting for the record. All votes will be recorded by roll call as request required by the open meeting law for any action before us today, Mr. Langworthy will take the roll call. At the start of each discussion, I will call on all regents and student representatives for their questions and comments. I'll vary where we start during each item. If you don't wish to speak, you're welcome to pass and we'll use this process only once per agenda item. If you have a question or a comment that you believe cannot wait until your turn in the alphabet or you wish to speak a second time on a topic, please let Jason know via text or use the raise hand feature within Zoom and he will keep track of that and alert me. And then I'll make sure I get to everybody. And please don't talk over others or jump in without being recognized. You know all that from our prior meetings. So. Regents, uh, student representatives and presenters will all be muted until I call on them to speak. Please don't unmute or mute your line yourself. The board office staff will handle that for you. And please allow a very brief pause after you're called on before you start speaking. Um, I don't plan on calling on the administration members as we get into multiple presenter presentations and I'd appreciate it if the administration would simply go in order as uh, you've, you've aligned and as the slides line up, don't wait for me to uh, say, okay, that's uh, fine, uh, Vice President Burnett, we'll now move on to the next, just keep going from an efficiency standpoint. And uh, if a question comes to you from a regent, I don't think it's also critical that I step in the way to recognize you and the speaker or the regent unless it's not clear, in which case, uh, you know, I'll, I'll help direct where the question needs to go to. So just a couple of uh, things that we formally do in the board meeting room, we don't need to do here and we'll see how that works. And lastly, I'll remind everyone that even though we can't see our audience, they certainly can see us and uh, the meeting is live and open to the public via live stream video. It's also archived on our website for later viewing. Uh, with that, we have, as I noted at the close of uh, the Mission Fulfillment Committee, a very full agenda today with significant topics to review. So let's get started with item number one, which is the COVID-19 pandemic preliminary operational in impacts. And uh, this is essentially a discussion on the preliminary impacts of the pandemic on university operations. With us today are President Gable, Senior Vice President Burnett, Vice President Bertelson, Vice President Gulachek, and Interim Vice President Horstman. I'll note that we will talk more about the financial impacts of the pandemic on university opera on the university when we take up the operating budget during agenda item two. With that, President Gable, the, uh, the uh, electronic floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, members of the committee. Uh, the operational impacts resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic are significant across university services, information technology, and human resources. These units have addressed the immediate challenges of the pandemic head on, ramping up from emergency management plans to promoting virtual resources for our faculty and staff and students to enable teaching, research and work, and all forms of learning remotely. As we look ahead, the Finance and Operations Working Group um, will be relying upon the principles that you all approved at the last special board meeting on April 21st. That group is co-chaired by Senior Vice President Brian Burnett and Interim Vice President for HR Ken Horseman, and they are also looking at short and long-term operational implications of the pandemic with a deeper dive into what our new normal will look like. Before I turn the presentation over to the team, I wanna sincerely thank them and everyone on their teams for all of the good work they're doing. It's been a real day in day out effort to ensure that the operations of the university continue smoothly. We have been safe, 
We have had food for all of our students and who needed it. Our buildings are in good and safe condition. We're paying our employees on time. Our technology is supporting our efforts and so on. Everyone across the system is extremely grateful. And with that, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll turn it over to Senior Vice President Brian Burnett. Senior VP Burnett, you can jump right in. This is the uh, progression I was talking about. I don't think you need me to inter intercede in each case, so go go forward. Thank you, sir. Um, good morning, members. Good afternoon, members, and uh, I'm happy to present the uh, kick this up among our fellow leaders in the operations area. And as President Gable noted, we're going to focus primarily in this presentation on the operational impacts that have happened, uh, much like what you heard this morning. Um, for mission fulfillment on the academic side and the research side. Um, slide, please. As we noted to the board back on April 7th, the University of Minnesota found itself in this pandemic in a, in a position of strength on several fronts. And these are just some of the assets we believe we brought to the table for this um, event that is really unprecedented. Um, that said, it has been an incredible challenge for us to respond when the playbook keeps changing each day, the advice we get keeps changing each day, um, and we continue to try and react and do the best we can to support our students and our faculty, our staff and our researchers across this vast university. So with that, we'd like to lead off with uh, Vice President Mike Bertelson to talk about the impacts to university services and if he's having internet issues um, from his location, I will pinch hit for him, but let's hope that he can um, address his slide. So the next slide um, would be for Vice President Bertels. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, members. University Services has been faced with a variety of financial challenges due to the pandemic. Most immediate and significant are tied to auxiliary revenue, specifically for housing, dining, parking, and bookstores. Auxiliary services refunds for students through spring 2020 semester and the lost revenue is approximately $28 million on the Twin Cities campus and proportional to every other campus. For faculty and staff on the Twin Cities campus, individuals were given the option to suspend their parking contracts. Approximately 50% chose to do so. The total financial impact will depend upon the length of the extended reduced operations, but is approximately $60,000 a week. And of course, for all operations, revenue is down. Retail dining facilities and bookstores are closed to in-person shopping across the system, though bookstores continue to support the campus online. Parking is not seeing any event revenue, of course, and daily cash parking is significantly diminished. In unique times like this, we look to policies and procedures that we have in place to guide us. Our campus and building closing policy did not contemplate staying in reduced operations for a long period of time. So we made modifications to limit the financial exposure of paying 100% comp time for essential work conducted during reduced operations. Other language is added to broaden the number of employees expected to work remotely in order to increase overall productivity. The primary changes in the annual capital budget have been to auxiliary projects in housing, dining, and parking. Within university services, approximately $22 million of planned capital renewal projects were canceled or deferred in order to preserve cash and mitigate revenue losses. In addition, UMD has delayed its $70 million housing and dining project previously approved by the board. And of course, we have impacts for the future, some we know now and others that are still unanswerable. <laughs> Holding rates flat in 2021 represents an additional $3 million housing and dining challenge on the Twin Cities campus, which was part of a multi-year plan to fund Pioneer debt service, plus other costs such as food and negotiated wage increases for labor represented staff. Depending on the final university plans for the fall, impacts for housing, dining, and parking would be significant. Debt service for these units continues to be paid Modeling for the auxiliary units on the Twin Cities campus project that depending upon the plans for the fall, these units will face an additional revenue loss between 24 and $74 million next fiscal year. We're working to more clearly identify cost savings, projects to delay and other options. And Julie Tonneson will have more context about these 
financial models in the later presentation. Next slide, please. The first part of managing through an emergency is the preparation and planning that occurs long before the event. As the President noted last month, we spend a lot of time preparing for emergencies, developing policies and practices, regularly conducting exercises, updating emergency operation plans, training senior leaders and more. University Services is home to two areas of the University Planning and Emergency Management. Health Emergency Response Office supports the Public Health Officer <coughs> is in daily contact with the Minnesota Department of Health. The Department of Emergency Management provides operational coordination across the system and is in routine contact with the State Emergency Operations Center. And my office provides daily support to the President's Emergency Management COVID team on a daily basis. Even though most students, faculty, and staff are working remotely, our campuses are not shut down. We continue to maintain safe campuses for the operations that do continue. This includes supporting remaining students in housing, essential on-campus staff, limited critical research, ongoing critical care, and more. This work also includes coordinating the distribution of appropriate PPE to those who need it and advising on other productive equipment for essential on-campus staff. We have essential employees in all of our units, in our auxiliary and facilities. There is essential work to be done, but not as much as usual for areas such as dining and custodial. To keep staff fresh and to fairly distribute the workload, those employees are being rotated on and off duty. My thanks to essential employees for their dedication, flexibility, and cooperation. Many major construction projects are moving ahead. The governor has deemed this activity essential and contractors can safely work and are, used, and are used to utilizing appropriate PPE. Maintenance work is also advancing. Routine preventive maintenance, repairs, and other work that often waits until people leave campus are able to get done. These staff aren't able to work from home, but their work can be done safely with appropriate safety practices. Our units have also been working to prepare contingency plans for the university to support a surge in capacity at hospitals if needed. This includes both planning for overflow of non-COVID hospital beds and planning for the availability of beds for healthcare system workers between shifts or to self-quarantine if necessary. University health and safety staff are developing safe work and safe learning guidelines for the eventual return to campus. This will include thinking about how people are spaced in offices, classrooms, labs, and dining centers. Next slide and next speaker. Next slide, please. An initial objective at the onset of the pandemic was to ensure faculty, staff, and student workers who needed to quarantine, were ill, were providing care to a family member or children due to closures, had the support of an emergency paid leave. The university implemented such a leave at the start of the extended reduced operations the week of March 23rd and supplemented it on April 1st with the federal sick leave and expanded family medical leave mandated under the Federal Families Coronavirus Response Act. To blend these leaves in a compliant and consistent way required significant operational and systems HR work, as the FFCRA does require employers to track the overall use of this new program. Both leave programs can provide up to 80 hours of paid leave for these circumstances in addition to expanded FMLA for childcare, while the employer can be eligible for tax credit. We have developed and implemented cost containment strategies quickly, including a hiring freeze, a reclassification freeze for employee groups, excluding obligations to groups collectively bargained, and a freeze on lump sum pay increases. As well, the president has announced a merit freeze for employee groups not collectively bargained for this year, subject to board approval. With our finance partners, we are able to implement quickly the deferral of FICA tax payments starting in early April this year. This deferral allows for additional liquidity through calendar 2020 and into 2021. To help colleges and units across the system cope with a range of high and low workloads, we have developed a talent share program and no addition, at no additional administrative or program cost, which matches work opportunities on one campus or unit with employees in another unit who have capacity. 
In its first two weeks, we have reviewed 20 possible matches for talent share, including cross-campus opportunities. We have also had interest from other peer institutions calling us to discuss this new program. Through this time frame, HR has played a critical role in supporting leaders and employees. It is even more important to continue performance discussions in our review process in a remote work environment and the streamlined performance review approach, which we gradually implemented over the last year, has made great strides and is able to meet leaders and managers as they contend to complete this important process in this new environment. In FY21, 64% of the university staff will be engaging in this process across the common platform. Additionally, we developed a primer to guide replacement and succession planning for senior leaders, and we are now planning to broaden the university leadership this guidance is shared with. Coaching sessions and webinars have been in high demand as managers and employees deal with significant change, and this did include one session on continuing mission-critical work in difficult times, which drew over 500 participants. We have established ongoing discussions at first daily and now three times a week with all human resource leaders at the university. This has been critical to arrive at common solutions and consistent practice. Work from this effort has resulted in an HR COVID-19 web landing page that provides answers to hundreds of possible HR leader and employee questions. Next slide, please. Significant work has continued and been accelerated to implement virtual resources for work and personal, mental, physical, and financial health and well-being. Best practices have been made available for remote work, including a streamlined telecommuting approach and a webinar on remote work itself that it attracted over 900 engaged employees on how to work effectively remotely. Uh, as an example of this, OHR operations partnered with OIT and has been able to establish full OHR call center capability remotely, including phone capability. Adjustments have been made to implement on our health plans to account for COVID-19 and remove any potential barriers to those who require services. Finally, in the midst of the significant financial market volatility in February and March, the Retirement Governance Committee determined that an extension of our retirement plan transition to Fidelity was necessary. With the time that has been available prior to the new date of June 12, human resource and investment and banking team members have developed a new approach that allows 97% of transferable assets to move in kind and not experience even a day out of market during this volatile time and transition. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Chair McMillan and members of the committee, it's always a privilege for me to be here with you. As described in your docket materials, University of Minnesota information technologists have been extremely focused on easing the nearly 90,000 students faculty and staff into what can only be described as a radically different teaching, learning and remote work environment. As viewed from a very specific and purely technical perspective, this has gone relatively smoothly. The impact, however, has been both exhilarating and exhausting to technologists and technology teams as it has been to everyone. The systems supporting the university during COVID operations have experienced spikes in usage well beyond those that are typically experienced during the beginning of the academic year, which is when we typically see our highest volume. And sustained volume increases are in orders of magnitude. The smooth technical transition to COVID operations can mostly be attributed to the timing and quality of previous technology platform decisions, as Senior Vice President Burnett alluded to earlier, many of which were approved by this board that were followed by successful implementations and effective operations by very competent IT staff. The Moodle to Canvas transition for learning management, WebEx to Zoom for video conferencing, MediaMill to Kaltura for lecture capture, simple password to two-factor authentication for security, and the recently implemented network technologies are just a few of the examples of these well-timed decisions, along with, of course, the enterprise system upgrade in 2015, and the adoption of the Google platform several years before that. 
At the same time that platform modernization was occurring, technology service redesign and operational maturity improvements led to greater simplicity, consistency, and better outcomes, which essentially helped users of these services with a rapid change to alternative instruction and remote working. The university's growth in areas such as vulnerability management, service reliability management, and help desk and computer device support were critical to the transition and current operations. Another very key enabler to this smooth transition was the very recent engagement between instructors and academic technologists because of the recently completed learning management transition. Next slide, please. This optimal position enabled technologists from across the university to systemically and a coordinated way focus on instructors, staff, and students who were most impacted by the rapidly changing need to conduct the university's business remotely. Communicators quickly assembled the Keep Teaching and Working and Learning Off-Campus websites as informational resources, while technologists held live virtual sessions to help instructors and staff with the use of electronic tools that they needed to effectively teach and work remotely. In short, because of the well-timed technology platform modernizations and very intentional service and operationally maturity initiatives, technologists were able to help instructors, staff, and students radically change the way that they had been teaching, learning, or working in a very short period of time. Said another way, committee members, the transition that we recently underwent in our current operational status would simply not have been achievable without this university's senior leadership and board support. For that, I am extraordinarily grateful to all of you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that concludes my remarks and those of my colleagues. We look forward to your discussion and to answer your, your questions. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you, uh, each of you. And I think that provides the board with a nice framework for opening a discussion at this point about uh, the operational. Well, as I said earlier, we'll turn to financial next, but uh, the, uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, a research university and how it works under these, uh, these circumstances. So uh, Regent Anderson, you, your alphabetical preeminence is either a blessing or a curse but I promise in the six items we're gonna to do today, I'm gonna to move on, but I'm gonna start with you if, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're ready and uh, you all know our protocol, uh, I'll go in order and you uh, have lots of topics here that you may wanna discuss and you don't have to though, we can move on without, uh, without questions if anyone so desires. Reach well, I, Anderson. I, I appreciate what they're all doing and things like that. Most of my questions are probably coming to finance portion Although I, I did, I think I heard uh, Vice President Bertelson mention something about in university services were projecting for 24, either projecting or they could be 24 to $74 million of potential losses next year. What, did I mishear that or was that in his presentation? Vice President uh, Bertelson, I heard 24 to 74 million in auxiliary. Maybe you can clarify. That's true. Um, it would be, we used projections much like we experienced um, at the end of this semester. So it has a lot of uh, guesses about how many students would actually come and choose to live on campus. Would they choose to stay at home? If they stay at home, then they're less likely to eat meal plans and less likely to park. And so it's uh, a lot of assumptions about how, how many students start in the fall and how many, or uh, does it, extend as far as later in the spring. And that will fall into the scenario planning that um, okay. Brian and Julie will talk to you later about. Thank you, thank you, that's fine. Okay, uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, presenters. Uh, Director Horseman, I know the, um, the pressure that hiring freezes uh, put on the institution. Uh, I understand there's some anecdotal evidence that, that shared services between and among the uh, units is beginning to um, increase. I think that's really a smart way and often a, a, um, um, a long-term solution 
uh, you know, in areas of finance, HR, even, uh, or IT, um, having somebody work um, uh, in another unit, with another unit is very practical and it breaks down those operational silos. Uh, Chair McMillan, Regent Beeson, I appreciate the comment. Uh, we feel the same way. I think through the hiring freeze process, we are identifying opportunities where we can work together with units to address that same thing. We find that internally in departments, people are starting to think that way and do it in their own academic and administrative units. So this talent share program is actually uh, layered on top of that and broadens that perspective. And we're, we're very excited about where this could go. Follow up, Regent Beeson? No, thank you. All right, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair McMillan, and thank you to the presenters and your teams for the uh, heavy lifting, I guess that's literally and metaphorically, um, in each of your area, areas. Uh, I anticipate questions I have will be answered in the next round, so I'll pass at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Davenport. Uh, Regent Herr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for uh, Vice President um, Wellington with regards to uh, on-campus housing. Because uh, I know a couple of students that are going to come to the U in the fall and they on their own are looking for housing. And I don't know if the dorms are opened for them at this point or not, but they are making decisions to rent already. So I'm getting into that commitment going forward, whether there is um, in-person uh, uh, instruction or not. Is there concerns about um, just the loss of revenue within this competitive market and things are still iffy with regards to whether or not we are going to proceed with whatever tier scenarios we have with regards to uh, um, instruction and people living in the resident hall in the fall. Um, Regent Herr, um, yeah, I think those are the, those are certainly variables and concerns if, um, you know, if we are only doing online instruction in the fall um, what does that mean for our students living on campus? So we are working very closely with the Department of Health, uh, getting guidance for them about congregate living and under what circumstances and what conditions that make sense. Um, in the meantime, we are um, operating and taking uh, applications for housing and guaranteed for housing as if we are in normal per operations for the fall. So we are taking applications as we speak and guarantees for housing now. Um, and if someone was looking for housing in the summer, they still should contact our housing department. Um, we still do have students living with us through the summer, uh, some doing summer school and others who don't have a place to live and we are our be their best option. Um, we also through off-campus housing um, can help them make contacts with if they wanna live off campus because those, those off-campus apartments are still looking and taking students and applications as well. So I think we're operating as if everything is full go, preparing for that, but also making contingency plans if um, that doesn't work. Thank you, thank you. Regent Her, follow up? Go ahead. No, it's, uh, no, thank you for the response, it's just, uh, I know, and then it's hard because students want a uh, definitive uh, response from us, but right now we're still kind of open up in the air. So uh, I guess we just have to proceed with the best information as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Regent uh, Her. Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, just a general comment, um, and thank you for what everybody is doing. But uh, I was a little bit uh, taken aback by the fact that we received a presentation with no numbers, yet we received a presentation, live presentation with a bunch of numbers. So um, how can we get access to the, all the numbers that were just read off in the presentation that um, is not in the docket? That's question number one. Um, 
someone can answer that. Or... Senior Vice President Burnett, perhaps that's uh, in your wheelhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regent Hsu, uh, the numbers that were alluded to by some of the vice presidents in this presentation are counted, are they're included in what we're going to be discussing in the next presentation. So the numbers Vice President Bertelson were discussing are inside the numbers that we're going to present to you in the next piece. So that's just a piece of that. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess that's okay, but it would be nice to have a presentation. If we're going to be reading information out of our docket, it'd be from It'd be nice to have the information that uh, we're going to receive in the presentation. So um, uh, uh, going to the, my next question, uh, if we are back on campus in the fall, um, do you have an idea of what the extra costs are going to be? And uh, obviously, you know, offsetting that with the, um, the costs or the expenses that uh, we'll be saving. Uh, would be nice to know. Um, next question, how many students um, are currently in the residence halls and how many are we going to be housing over the summer and how is the food service uh, going to be working for that? Vice President Bertelson, that sounds like uh, your, your territory. Um, yes, yeah, so Regent Chu um, at uh, last count, we are something uh, just under 600 students who are still living with uh, us on the Twin Cities in housing through the summer. Um, until the end of semester, which will be you know, next week, um, they're in the same places as they were through the semester. At the end of the semester, the residence hall, students in the residence hall, and that's about half of those, about 300 students are in the residence halls. They, at the end of semester after May 13th, they will be, um, if those who are choosing to stay with us uh, into the summer will be consolidating um, into Pioneer Hall. Um, right now we have four dining centers open, but we will uh, again be consolidating to one dining center in Pioneer uh, at the end of the semester through the summer. Um, we are um, there's several hundred students who will be, uh, a, couple, a couple hundred students anyway, that will be uh, living with us through the summer. And I don't have those act final numbers. They were still um, tallying those. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow up, Mr. Yes, Chair? Yes, please. Uh, regarding the applications you discussed, how, how are those uh, going compared to previous years? The applications for housing um, are, pretty much on par with um, the conversation you had this morning um, with uh, Vice Provost McMaster. So um, I've asked for, uh, we're, we're tracking those. The last I knew we were um, something about 10% down, um, but though our guarantees tend to follow almost exactly with um, um, what what the applications are. So it, May 15th was our traditional day for students to make their guaranteed housing. And that's a date that we would, um, that's a date we'll be tracking to see what the, uh, see how many we think actually put money down. Um, and that'll be another marker in the process for us. Regent Chu. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, that answer. Um, how are we doing, I don't know if we've looked at this, but how are we doing with um, the local metro area kids who could actually um, decide to live at home instead of uh, in a dorm, uh, especially since they don't know whether, whether or not uh, we're gonna be having on cam campus classes? How, are we, how do we- President do Bertelson, is that something you're prepared mm -hmm. to answer or not? Yep, it's um, Regent Chu, that's a, a very good question and it's, what we're doing is, as we're doing scenario planning for the fall, um, our assumption is that if we are fully open uh, at the beginning of the semester, we're anticipating that most students still will want to um, be, meet with their classmates and be on campus, um, but we will be watching the housing guarantee numbers for that. We are also, as the university does contingency planning, we understand that that may, um, if we don't start online, more students may choose to stay at home, at least for the beginning of that semester. We have not yet begun or tried to piece together what um, 
some kind of survey response. We're trying to think about what's the best way, what's the best means and the best time to connect to those students and their families about those plans as we know more information. But th those are questions that we are anticipating, um, but I don't have any more information about that yet. Regent Chu, another follow-up or so? We need to keep moving. Uh, yes, I, I have a technology question. Um, uh, what, uh, to what extent are we relying on kind of infrastructure outside of the university for you know, all of these uh, Zoom calls? You know, for example, you know, I don't think people are doing a lot of Zoom calls you know, on campus. Well, there are some, but most of the people are not on campus. So are we, how are we dealing with uh, people who don't have internet access where they live or wherever they're staying? Um, and are they somehow able to go in through the university and, and access those resources? Uh, Regent Shu, members of the committee, I think there are a few answers to those questions that you just described. Um, we are relying on several clouds, cloud-based platforms to be able to provide some of the services or at least the services that are core to the teaching and learning mission right now. Canvas obviously is our course management system and that is, that is hosted in the cloud, as is Zoom. There have been over 300,000 uh, course meetings, course and administrative meetings since March 18th as of this morning. Um, the, the access to Zoom it can be reached via, via mobile device and via computer, as you well know. And, um, and in addition to the, uh, to the computer labs being available as buildings have been accessible to students, um, both internet service providers in the local community and in other places uh, across the United States have been offering either free or discounted internet services during this time. So we have been monitoring that condition very closely and uh, collegiate units have provided in some instances uh, computers to students and have been, and worked with students to, to acquire internet access if they needed that. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, it does, thank you. All right. Uh... I'm going to move on here to uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Uh, I think my question is for Vice President Bertelson um, about, about what you kind of alluded to this about modifications needing to be made in terms of the distancing and office spacing and whatnot on campus. And I just wanted you to talk a bit more about that. I think we all understand what not returning to the campus in fall looks like and then or completely returning normally, but there seems to be this in between. What kind of mitigations would have to be made um, just in the terms of way we operate going forward physically? Um, Regent Kenyaya, um, those are good questions. And frankly, we're still working out exactly how to do that. We understand, I think you're right, that there is an in-between. There's something between all or nothing. Um, some of that has to do with using safe PPE. So I expect things like masks, um, it may do include obviously more uh, Zoom meetings like this. Um, we're building a list of practices, um, and I think there'll be much more to come. I don't, we don't have that uh, plan laid out yet. All right, thank you, Regent Mara. Thank you. I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, Regent Powell. Interim, interim Vice President uh, Horseman, and he he commented on, you know, the some of his, uh, you know, the work that his team have done, in particular the hiring freeze, um, and 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 the fact that that you know in a way is is giving us the opportunity to double up, to centralize some th some things, to share, and I'm just wondering if I, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Assistant uh, Interim Vice President Horseman if he can give us other commentary on, you know, he, as, as he's, you know, coming into this role now, he's relatively new, but, uh, but obviously a very highly experienced HR executive, other opportunities that he sees, you know, either as a result of his prior experience or as a result of opportunities revealed by the crisis, you know, to be, to be more efficient. Um, 
Chair McMillan, uh, Regent Powell, thank you for that question. Um, I think um, <clears throat> any of us who have had more modest crises compared to the pandemic would realize there are opportunities to come out of it in a different way and work differently. And I think we're just at the beginning of that journey. Um, I do think uh, in regard to my own backyard, um, we have talked with HR leaders around the university about working a different way. Uh, not necessarily uh, does that mean centralizing all services, but there could be hubbing, there could be a different approaches that not only streamline um, administration, but also reduce potential errors and free up valuable time uh, for higher level uh, work in the HR arena that would bring um, value to the university and the mission. So we are again in the starting phases of, uh, of work sharing, um, talent sharing, but I think uh, where we have had successes, you do see the, the the realization that this is something that is sustainable and something that we should be practicing uh, each time uh, we think we have a, an opportunity to hire, we should be reflecting on that and, um, and making that critical choice. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of potential. Um, I like the fact that all of our HR leaders have come together as one. Um, you know, I respect the talents and skills we have uh, it, it informs solutions so much better when you know how you're impacting your internal clients. And uh, not every discussion is easy, but nor should it be. Conflict does result in more and better uh, solutions often. So um, I will stop there and see if you have any follow-ups. I, I don't. I, I appreciate that you're seeing that there is opportunity here and that you're, in, and that you're pursuing those. So thank you. Regent Rosha. Um, pass, thank you. Okay. Uh, Regent Simonson. Uh, my questions were, uh, were presented by Regent Beeson and Regent Powell. I just want to comment that I do look forward to seeing some of the uh, cost savings associated with work sharing or talent going forward. So appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Regent Swiggum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to. Uh, ask a question of uh, VP Horseman or interim VP Horseman. Um, and it's regarding the hiring freeze, if I could, that the president has suggested and, <clears throat> and brought forward. Uh, I see the hiring freeze as being very significant, which we address our, uh, our, our number of headcount uh, as we address our administrative, potential administrative overburden. Uh, and I'm just kind of uh, like to know, Ms. Horseman, how is it being implemented? I assume there has to be a few exceptions. I, I assume there are a few positions we just simply can't operate without. Uh, but overall, uh, how's it being implemented? We have thousands of uh, retirees each year or people leaving, although they're probably not leaving positions right now at this time, uh, that are we're trying to address through attrition through those that are, uh, are uh, retiring. Give me the little feeling of the implementation and, uh, you know, was it 5% or 10% of the exceptions from openings and get hired? Give me a little more background, if you would. Um, certainly, Chair McMillan, uh, Regent Sigam, thank you for the question. Um, a hiring freeze is new for a lot of our leadership and staff, um, but the way we have approached it is uh, we took a pause on any hiring uh, in late March into early April and reviewed currently posted openings. You're right, there are exceptions for COVID related research and clinical needs. Uh, those uh, we certainly uh, do not hold up. Um, we do also look at the need to support instruction for summer classes and in the fall. So there's maintaining that piece as well that's necessary. But outside of that, any administrative position, um, any um, new appointment of faculty, anything incremental like that is reviewed not only by my office, but by the provost office. And uh, if we have not determined 
a decision at that point, we certainly bring in the president's office or a senior vice president Burnett, Burnett to uh, review it as well. So we're taking a very cautious, slow approach. I know we are because I have a lot of people asking me why there's a traffic jam in my office with exceptions. But I think that means we're approaching it correctly, correctly and thoughtfully. And I know you like statistics, so I don't have a percentage. What I can tell you is in March of uh, 2019, we made 500 hires. Uh, with this in place for one week in March of 2020, uh, we had slightly over 300 hires in March 2020. So if you look year over year, there was a significant reduction already in March in the hires we were making likely at the end of the month, and we will continue to track that as we move forward. This is an evolving situation, so uh, as our, uh, we come out of this, uh, we may adjust the program as well, but we will be tracking it as we go forward. Follow-up question, Mr. McMillan, or Chair McMillan? You certainly, Regent Swigum. And, and very quick, Mr. Horstman, uh, two years ago, the board by action, um, implemented some type of a process where we were going to review those uh, positions that became open and only rehire if uh, necessary. It, it proved not to be very successful. In fact, it proved to be very unsuccessful from a standpoint of headcount. Looking ahead with your March 219 over 220 uh, prorating that, uh, suppose we were to keep this hiring freeze in place for a majority of the rest of the year. Uh, would you anticipate that we might have a headcount uh, reduction of, of 1,000 or 1,500 or 500? Or is that an unfair question to ask of you of what your anticipation might be as to the consequence? Well, um, I, I appreciate the question. And I, I like to look at forecasting where we might go with things. I think given this is a muscle we're developing, to be honest, um, uh, I would like to uh, see it in practice a little longer and see what the long-term strategy is. Uh, we certainly could build a model once we develop it on how we project this out. I do know that we have approximately, we have a lot more attrition than this, but we have about 600 retirements a year across all the employee groups. So we have some of that information already that we can use to factor into this to put together a more uh, specific workforce plan for the university. I appreciate your answer. I, I certainly recognize that models don't always uh, work out. Plans don't always work out, Mr. Horstman. Uh, in particular, we've seen lots of models on COVID-19 that haven't seen to uh, work out to the numbers of what the uh, model anticipated they would. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Uh, let's turn to our student representatives, uh, beginning with uh, Representative Batten. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have no comments at this time. Okay. And how about uh, Representative Tojo Garcia? Uh, thank you, Chair. I also have no questions at this time. Very good. Well, that uh, everyone's had an opportunity to speak. I'm Checking my uh, and my note says no additional speakers at this time. So let's move into a uh, the discussion of the 2021 annual operating budget and uh, reminding folks this is uh, here for review today and uh, it we will actually act on the operating budget at our regular June meeting and uh, that's scheduled for June 11th. Until then, we'll be collecting feedback on the budget from the university community. And the way we're doing that this year, as anyone could probably have predicted or guessed, is online. And uh, that's part of our bylaws and our, the process we normally follow. We won't likely have an in-person meeting this year. So the board's website is the place to submit those comments. The online, period, uh, online comment period is open and uh, will remain open until June, Tuesday, June 2nd. Any and all input we receive during the comment period is included in the June 11th meeting docket materials and will become part of our official public record. The name and the affiliation of the commenter will also be included in that. 
So with that uh, note about uh, the importance of following our process and the importance of gathering public and community input, I invite uh, President Gable, Senior Vice President Burnett, Interim Vice President Horstman and Associate Vice President Tonneson to walk us through the operating budget. And uh, after we begin with President Cable, why don't the four of you work through that in order and uh, don't uh, you don't need to wait for me to welcome each of you individually. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, uh, members of the committee. At the special board meetings on April 7th and April 21st, we discussed the financial impact of the pandemic on the university. Building upon the information we provided to you then, we bring before you the president's recommended fiscal year 2021 annual operating budget, which we are now calling the COVID-19 adjusted budget or CAB for your consideration. As Senior Vice President Brian Burnett and Associate Vice President Julie Tonson will highlight in more detail in just a few moments, the budget is not an operation as usual budget, but instead is an informed and modified base level of operations and resulting budgets from which potential contingency plans can be shaped. The CAB is based on a series of COVID-19 related assumptions that Brian and Julie will bring to your attention, including the savings that we've already experienced based on the decisions you've already heard described. In addition to the CAB, we will also be sharing with you two contingency plans for your consideration. If the conditions outlined for either contingency are met, we will be coming forward with recommended adjustments to the approved CAB to incorporate the actions envisioned in these contingencies. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, President Gable, for that introduction. Um, as we move to the next slide, I'm pleased to bring this forth to you today. We don't usually do this, but in light of our current unprecedented circumstances, we wanted to start this presentation today with an update of how we will close out the current fiscal year, or FY20. As we described in early April to you, our plan is to conduct in-depth analyses with units across the university during the months of May and June to determine where there are significant COVID-19 related budgetary impacts. We will be looking for revenue losses and expenditure increases compared to budget, ultimately finding and defining those shortfalls. And for each of these shortfalls, we will deploy the seven step analysis we explained in April, as solutions to filling these holes. Asking first, if all relevant external reimbursements for particular activities have been factored in, then looking for the natural spending reductions due to decreased operations, then looking to unit level reserves planned specifically as a hedge against revenue risk, and then looking to unit level available balances, and finally, to the three institutional tools available to, to address shortfalls, the Federal CARES Act funds, roughly around 18 million, and available central balances, and finally, central reserves. At the March board meeting in Duluth, you approved a spending authority of 5 million this fiscal year from central reserves. At this point, because the unit by unit analysis will not be complete until near the very end of the fiscal year, we are requesting a larger total, 25 million in spending authority to use specifically to fill holes before we get to the FY21 budget on July 1st. We are treating the FY20 budget impacts as non-recurring one-time events that we propose to completely address in the ways I've just described. That leaves FY21 as a fresh starting point from which to launch additional plans to tackle the new or continuing challenges. If the full 25 million is not needed for this purpose in FY20, it would carry over into FY21 and serve to increase the Central Reserves balance next year. We will talk more about the proposed plans for Central Reserves as part of the FY21 budget in an upcoming slide. I would also note that this 18 million, before we move to the next slide, we were notified earlier this week, in fact, on May 4th, that there's an extra about 100,000 for the Twin Cities and 170,000 to Morris Campus because of the populations they serve 
that came after we had reported to the board and put this docket together. So together we have about 18 million in total additional funds that don't aren't scheduled to go to this, at least designated to be to assist students under the Federal CARES Act. And we'll talk more about that later. So slides into FY21. So as President Gable noted, we are bringing you a budget in three parts, a fully detailed COVID-19 adjusted budget or our cap. As we'll detail, this will include our known impacts or those around where there's a high level of confidence of the COVID-19 pandemic on our budget. This includes predicted revenue losses, expenditure increases and decreases, and the planned responses to those situations. We've incorporated all of those into the details in this cap. But it's also important to understand that it also includes many regular activities of the university that are not as impacted by the pandemic, at least not in FY21. Things like our fringe benefit cost increases, the labor agreements we've agreed to, debt service increases, security, compliance, technology, software, maintenance agreements, library costs, sponsored research, endowment payouts, et cetera. It is a fully balanced budget based on the best information we have available to us today, factoring in all of these components. The second part is what we're calling contingency plan one. We are presenting today a framework for estimating and addressing the impact of the possible possibility of reduced operations into the fall. And we will explain in detail what that means. And that's at the same time, this is true for the third part of the budget, what we are calling contingency plan two, which is a framework for estimating and addressing the impact of reduced operations that would last through the rest of this calendar year. We are not asking you to approve a modified budget under either contingency one or two. We are asking you to review them and provide input and direction on those plans. And then if we recommend moving forward formally to one or both of these scenarios in the future, it is our plan to bring back an amended full budget to the board for your, your review and approval at a later date. So first, let's focus on the cab. Slide, please. The part that is recommended for your review and action in June is indeed this cab. In summary, the budget includes estimated revenues and expenditures in all funds, plus the COVID-19 related assumptions identified here. Very simply, it is based on the fact that we will be in reduced operating status at some level into this summer. There's no question about that. And that means our earlier communicated decision to deliver summer session instruction will be only online and all study abroad activity canceled through summer. Since we haven't made yet made the decision about online versus on campus per, uh, classes in September, this budget assumes students will largely be back on campus with some exceptions and with physical distancing and adaptations being developed as part of the president's sunrise plan. As I've explained in the past, we build our total tuition revenue estimate working directly with each campus and college on the variables impacting them. And in this budget, 12 units are predicting slight decreases in total enrollment, some due to lower transfer numbers, reduced new freshman numbers, reduced retention rates of, for continuing students, and some have factored in a change in the non-resident resident mix or decrease in graduate students. Some of this was discussed earlier today in the Mission Fulfillment Committee. We also assume in the cab that housing and dining facilities will be open, but with a reduced occupancy compared to a normal year due to decisions students could be making about living at home and a potential reduction in the number of international students on campus. And finally, this budget assumes that the vast array of events and activities that occur throughout the U will phase back to normal. We will not turn a switch and everything will not be normal. We know that but we will get close to that in some activities through the fall. And that is one of the major assumptions in this budget. So as a result of these assumptions, combined with our estimated cost increases and needs that need to exist outside of the pandemic arena of assumptions, this budget includes the following recommendations in summary. Slide. 
And for this piece of the uh, presentation, I'd like to turn it over to Associate Vice President Tonneson. Thank you. Slide, please. Jason, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, the pie chart of revenues for FY21 under the assumptions and plans that were just laid out looks very similar to that for FY20. We anticipate a total revenue budget of $3.9 billion with the distribution across the restricted auxiliary and unrestricted categories as pictured here. Still, 41% of the budget will come from the O&M state appropriation and tuition combined. That has not changed. The one shift from last year is a move from 10% to 9% for the auxiliaries and the corresponding shift from 20 to 21% for the other restricted categories. It takes a significant change in revenue to shift these percentages from, from one year to the next. Uh, moving to briefly highlight some of the revenues in more detail as part of the CAB uh, slide, please. As you can see in the blue box, the recurring biennial increase in our appropriation is $22,620,000. That's for the biennium. We received the $20,880,000 increment this year, and we are anticipating and planning that the full state appropriation for both FY20 and FY21 will be paid to the university as in law. The FY21 increase is just $1,740,000. As you recall, however, we also planned and held 8 million of the FY20 appropriation increase for recurring use first in FY21. So the increment available to address FY21 recurring needs is $9,740,000 in this budget plan. News in recent days hasn't been good concerning the state's revenue forecast and its impact on the budget, but we have received no information regarding a reduction in our appropriation for this year or next year. Uh, if it would drop this year or if we believe um, there would be a drop next year, then we would have to pivot to and have and basically access our contingency planning process uh, to address that. Uh, slide, please. Moving to tuition. As uh, Brian mentioned earlier, the board approved a tuition freeze for all students and all levels for next year with three exceptions. Dentistry, which will be increasing 2.7 to 2.8%. The entering cohort for the medical school, which will be increasing 2%. And the entering cohort for three professional master's programs in the College of Science and Engineering. The Master of Science in Management of Technology, in medical device innovation and in security technologies, each of which will increase either 1.9% or 4.8%. All three of these program areas are experiencing high enrollment demand and feel their pricing strategies are in good alignment with comparable quality programs. In the case of the second two here, the tuition rates applied to the entering cohort of students will follow them through to their degree. So they will be paying the same rate for multiple years. As mentioned previously, 12 units are predicting decreases in enrollment, but five units are actually projecting increases in revenue, either because they are on a positive growth path, such as the Rochester campus, or because they are welcoming a full new cohort of students as the overall program is going, uh, as with the Doctorate of Occupational Therapy, or because their total resident to non-resident balance is shifting in a positive way, as in the College of Veterinary Medicine. As a result of these factors, all combined, the total net tuition revenue is estimated to decrease for next year just over $1 million. I would like to remind the board as well that FY21 will be the second year of the four-year phase in of the tuition surcharge in the College of Science and Engineering. The surcharge is not increasing but the school is estimating increases in revenue of $3 million due to a second cohort of entering students that will be subject to that surcharge. And to show how all that plays out in terms of actual rates, uh, we have the next slide. That is a list of our quote, primary tuition rates as we display each year, where you can see the resident and non-resident levels and the proposed changes for FY21. The full list of tuition rates can be found in attachment five to the budget, beginning on page 72 of the document. Slide, please. In alignment with the recommendation to hold tuition rates flat, 
The president is also recommending a freeze on all other student fees that are incorporated into the cost of attendance. This budget includes, includes no rate changes for existing course miscellaneous or academic fees, for the student services fees on each campus, for room and board charges on any campus, or for parking contracts. Examples of the change in tuition fees and room and board FY20 versus FY21 for resident undergraduate students can be found for each campus beginning on page 45 of the docket materials. Again, there's no increase from the current year. The tables are simply presented to provide information on what the example charges would be. For this example student, um, the costs range from $21,050 to 25385 slide, please. Aside from the state appropriation and tuition revenues, uh, as mentioned at the start of this presentation, this is an all funds budget, including the wide variety of other revenues generated by the institution. So within the cab, we have estimated all other earned revenues for FY21, many of which are projected to be negatively impacted by the pandemic. The three major categories of revenues are listed here with example types under each heading. The first category of miscellaneous unrestricted revenue sources are most often tied to events or services and products that people pay for. And with reduced operations into the fall, most of these will see some level of reduction compared to the current year. As indicated here, our estimates include a drop of almost $20 million in this activity compared to a quote normal year. That $20 million drop is, however, combined with some sporadic rebounding from this year, or actually even growth over the current year. So the final budget is down a net across all sources, about $15 million compared to FY20. Auxiliary operations that you heard about in the previous agenda item were significantly impacted in FY20, and under the CAB assumptions would drop again over $30 million in FY21. However, in this case, the final net revenue is actually up about $10 million from what we are projecting will be the final numbers in FY20, driven mostly by the large refunds to students impacting the FY20 numbers. And finally, in the restricted funds area, we are projecting relative stability. Most of these revenues are less likely to be impacted by reduced operations or reduced enrollment, for example, and yet because of the uncertainty in the economy, we're not projecting any real growth either. Those are pretty stable. Slide. And finally, as we do every year on the resource side, we must take into account some of the planned uses of revenue growth to address the framework cost increases. So some of those miscellaneous revenues that are, are positive and growing are, just as in every year, available to help us with cost increases that occur in the state and tuition fund. So indirect cost recovery in some units is projected to remain strong and even grow from the current year. And there is a small amount of FY20 tuition revenue over budget in some units that remains uncommitted and can be applied to costs in FY21. There are also some spe specifically identified use of O&M balances in the units and an overall O&M recurring structural balance in FY20 held centrally of roughly $200,000 that is available to offset the FY21 costs. Those resources are built into balancing this budget for the framework funds, the state appropriation and tuition. And based on what units have proposed and planned for to address all the assumptions in this budget, there will be approximately $20 million of internal budget cutting and reallocation to balance this CAB. Roughly 43% of that 20 million has been identified by the units as reductions to administrative costs and 44% has been identified as reduction to mission related costs. That leaves roughly 13% as yet unidentified, which is not unusual as some units have been asked to make reductions beyond what they originally planned. So the plans for that last 2.6 million are still being developed. Of the identified cut plans, 69% involve reductions to compensation, which is elimination of positions, salary savings from turnover, et cetera and 31% are related to reductions in general supplies, equipment, miscellaneous expenses. Uh, none of these planned reductions involve, quote, natural savings from reduced activities or savings from the hiring freeze. This $20 million is all over and above those kinds of responses. 
Examples of decisions within that 20 million plan reduction are included on page 40, pages 48 and 49 of your docket materials. Turning now to the spending plans in the COVID-19 adjusted budget. Can we go one more, please? Uh, total expenditures are estimated to be slightly higher than revenues, totaling $4 billion. The display of that $4 billion by function is shown in the table on the left of this slide. That distribution does not change appreciably from year to year. As with revenues, estimated impacts of the pandemic are built into the projected expenditures. Before making those adjustments, the projected expenditure growth over FY20, outside of any uh, large salary increases, would have been 2.4%. However, we have estimated a reduction in spending, not just reallocation, but actual reductions in spending of approximately $50 million associated with the impact of the pandemic. From reduced activity levels into the fall in many areas, even where revenue isn't dropping, uh, from the hiring freeze, which impacts salary and fringe, and the announced pay reductions at the cabinet level, and so forth. As a result, total expenditures in this budget are increasing only 1% over the prior year. Uh, for more information on the com compensation component of the budget, I'll turn it over to Interim Vice President Horseman for the next slide. Thank you, um, Associate Vice President Tonneson. In most years, compensation increases account for the largest increase in spending in the budget. And for FY21, we have two items that add cost, implementation of the collective bargaining agreements approved earlier this year, and the fringe cost increase resulting uh, from the required federal methodology of setting fringe rates to pay for costs from two years prior. Because there was an actual increase in fringe benefit costs between FY18 and FY19, driven primarily by healthcare, departments will see that expense increase hit their budgets in FY21. The incremental cost increase for these two items combined is 25 million, roughly 12.5 million in both the state and tuition funds and in all other funds combined. However, to help lower those costs, the president is recommending a hiring freeze as we move into FY21, which will lead to more open positions and salary savings. In addition, a merit freeze uh, pay will avoid cost increases on the current salary base over the next year. The net increase in compensation costs in this proposed budget overall is approximately $10 million. And with that, I will turn it back to Associate Vice President Tonneson. I believe. Actually, I'm gonna take the next slide to thank you, Interim Vice President Horseman. Moving to the non-compensation investments in the budget now, as I mentioned near the beginning of the presentation, this CAB includes estimates and actions that are a part of our normal operations before adjusting for the pandemic impacts we have been discussing. And this aspect shows up the list of investments included as attachment two to the budget, pages 68 and 69 of your docket. The president is recommending recurring investments of $26 million. This represents the dedicated resources from the O&M appropriation increase, from tuition growth in some units, and from internal reallocations to a variety of needs throughout the institution. 15.7 million of the 26 million is recommended to address basic operating needs in our units. Most of that will provide general support as small discretionary pools or to offset current year tuition shortfalls from what was budgeted. A small amount is dedicated to help address structural budget imbalances for the units you see listed here. And an additional amount is targeted for specific identified needs within units. Examples would include inflation on library materials, the cost driven by enrollment growth at our Rochester campus, and continuing plans to support the law school. Slide, please. I won't take the time to walk through all of the investments, but beyond general operating support, attachment two also itemizes recurring investments related to technology and facilities, student support and services, and programmatic support and compliance costs. In addition, we have itemized non-recurring investments here and slide, please. So this budget includes proposed allocations of 6 million 
to various one-time needs that were brought forward as part of our regular annual budget process. Examples are here in the top box. They represent either budgetary needs, um, as with the year in support anticipated for our system campuses, or one-time strategic investments for the long-term health of the institution, as with the Twin Cities Master Plan or reserve for potential police officer additions um, on the Twin Cities campus. And for the rest of the slide, I'm gonna turn it back to Associate Vice President Tonneson. Thank you. In addition, on the non-recurring side, this budget includes two items directly in response to the pandemic. The first is a plan to offer additional recruitment awards system-wide to help land the freshman class this fall amidst the different competition uh, they're facing compared to prior years. And the second is authorization to spend an additional $10 million as needed to address one-time bridging needs for units based on their revenue and cost projections for the year. This additional 10 million from central reserves would not go to every unit, but would be targeted to those that lack the balances and reserves to address what we determined to be uh, shorter term challenges, similar to what we proposed for the FY20 allocation. Beginning on page 60 of your docket materials, there is a summary of the projected impacts to central reserves as part of this budget. Uh, specifically for central reserves, it includes an estimated lower average balance in TIP, uh, lower yield assumptions than in recent past quarters. Uh, so the actual earnings for the year will be less than they have been in the last several years. It includes a planned allocation of 25 million in FY20, uh, as Senior Vice President Burnett mentioned at the beginning of this presentation to address COVID-19 driven budget shortfalls, a planned allocation of $10 million in FY21 to address COVID-19 driven budget shortfalls. And that all results in an estimated ending balance at the end of FY21 of $14 million which will be 13.8 million less than the board policy guidelines sets as the goal for the fund. Uh, since 2009, after some cash flow timing adjustments, there's been only one year, and that was last year, FY19, in which central reserves ended with a balance exceeding the policy guideline. One purpose of the reserve is to address financial challenges due to unforeseen shocks in the environment, to be kind of a rainy day fund, if you will. So that very rational and thoughtful intent for the fund combined with some exceptional earnings in the most recent past has resulted in this tool to, available to us to help navigate through this current shock. Through this budget, we recommend using this tool but not completely depleting the fund. Slide please. Uh, final slide on the CAB is a summary of the proposed framework for balancing the state and tuition fund portion of the budget as we show every year. It reflects the changes for FY21 as outlined in the preceding slides. Incremental resources over FY20 of 39.2 million and incremental spending of 38.6 million, leaving a $600,000 recurring balance. Again, that is in the state appropriation and tuition fund portion of the budget only. I don't have a similar framework for the rest of the funds displayed in this presentation, but on an all funds basis, with the cost increases and in investments identified here on this slide, plus the total estimated for all of the other funds, including the impacts of the pandemic, incremental revenues in this budget, plus the total carry forward into the year, will be up 39.2 million over FY20. Incremental spending will be up 48.4 million over FY20. So the overall university all funds balance is projected to drop 9.2 million below the ending balance for FY20. The non-sponsored fund portion of these, these changes is reflected in the university fiscal page attachment one to the budget document on page 67 of the docket materials. And that Mr. Chair is a summary of the COVID-19 adjusted budget that we recommend uh, for your review and approval. Moving on, we'd like to summarize uh, the second and third parts of this budget recommendation, namely contingency plan one and contingency plan two. Why don't you proceed? The assumptions please. of each are summarized here on this slide. Contingency plan one assumes that normal operations and instruction do not return to our campuses by September, but instead return more in the October, November timeframe for most students and employees. The semester would start with online instruction and transition to in-person instruction by about that time. 
It also includes a roughly 5% reduction in total enrollment as a result. An assumption that housing and dining facilities are not open for most students until mid-fall semester and that our many revenue generating events and activities phase in more slowly than under the CAB. The financial challenge, challenge associated with this plan is estimated to be an additional 124.5 million over and above what was incorporated and solved for in the CAB we just described. Contingency plan two pushes those assumptions out until spring. So employees and students would not be back on campus until spring semester. Total enrollment under this um, contingency plan is estimated to be down 10.5% and housing and dining facilities are closed until spring and the revenue generating events don't return until spring. The resulting financial challenge from these assumptions is estimated to be an additional 146.5 million over and above contingency plan one. So solving for both contingency one and contingency two would require decisions to address 271 million. And that's on top of what we've already addressed and recommend to address in the CAB. The assumptions, especially related to enrollment are spelled out in more detail in your, in your docket materials on pages 64 and 65. At this time, uh, slide please, we are offering a skeleton plan of how to address the financial challenge under these scenarios. Please understand, however, that we will continually reassess where things are as we go through the upcoming weeks. And we are prepared to make alterations to what is presented here today in response to the changing situations. As it stands today, we would enter the planning process with the following goals. One, we believe that some level of natural cost reduction from reduced operations will continue under these scenarios. Based on what has happened thus far this spring, we know those savings will fall differently across funds and units, and we have built that, those factors into the estimates that you see here. We have set budget reduction or reallocation targets uh, for O&M in all units at two levels, a 3% reduction target and a 6% reduction target. These require plans over and above the reallocations of $20 million that were described in the CAB. The plans can and should be a combination of non-recurring savings and recurring savings. And again, those are only in the state appropriation and tuition funds. In all other funds, units will be required to reduce expenditures further to coincide with the additional losses of revenue in these scenarios. The exact amounts will differ across units due to the varying nature of their activities and thus their challenges. The university will analyze what's happening in these funds and the ability of units to adequately address the situations. University support might be needed on a one-time basis and in some cases a permanent movement of expenses to O&M may be warranted. In rare places, additional revenue growth may be available to offset other revenue losses or expenditure increases. For example, if ICR grows from new grant opportunities related to public health or disease research, those revenues can help address the challenge in the units engaged in that activity. Finally, we anticipate the further use of balances that remain in some units or in central to close the gap. If the full $25 million set aside in FY20 as we're proposing from central reserves is not needed this fiscal year, for example, we could access it next year if needed. Because there are so many unknowns in this situation and no history to base analysis on, we recommend moving forward with this general framework and adjusting as necessary along the way. We also recommend that if it appears things are returning slower than these plans anticipate and that we cannot return to any kind of normal operations for next spring, we will need to pivot once more and adjust our estimated financial challenge. Trying to address that spring scenario or past spring scenario right now will move us into estimates with very low confidence levels when we believe waiting weeks will not weaken our position, but will enhance the information available for decision makers. In addition to these factors, it's important to remember that the president has charged two work groups to plan for ways to address future challenges. And I'll turn it over to Vice President Horseman and Senior Vice President Burnett to provide information on the finance and operations planning work group and what they are working on. Thank you, Associate Vice President Connison. 
As part of the process of developing contingency plans, the president charged the finance and operations planning work group to develop recommendations that enable the university to retain its workforce by leveraging existing and new tools and policies. Leveraging economies of scale, finding new cost saving measures across the system and finding opportunities to outsource or insource to achieve greater revenue or institutional savings. That group is in the process right now of gathering ideas and discussing options that will save the institution money in a variety of ways. We are considering options in two primary groupings, one-time payroll savings. This could include furloughs implemented broadly across the institution, plus temporary pay cuts for some employees. The range of savings here can be vast, depending on the number of furlough days and the percentage of pay reduction chosen. This could be as low as $8 million, or it could exceed $100 million depending on what is needed when the analysis is complete. Combined with what is strategic and aligns with our guiding principles of making decisions to the best interests of our faculty and staff in mind. A secondary category, but as important, are longer term savings from process and structure changes across the institution. The impact of these may not be immediate, yet they would help reduce costs in the long run by working smarter and gaining efficiencies. In this bucket are ideas such as shared services, paperless operations, permanent reductions to some categories of spending, outsourcing or insourcing, and, and beyond that. Recommendations from the group will take shape over the next several weeks, and some of those will involve a call for more in-depth analysis and additional sub teams over the next six months. And with that, I will turn it over to Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Interim Vice President Horseman. To summarize this slide for the board to understand the work that's already underway and continues, uh, really two parts. This part that, that, uh, that Ken talked about, this temporary payroll savings at, and the things we're looking at, how do we solve those contingency one or contingency two numbers yet in fiscal year 21. So immediate things that can help balance the budget. These efficiencies through process and structure changes are things that are gonna be longer term implementation and are, would, would affect future budgets and wouldn't be things that would uh, help us balance FY21 if we need to pivot. So it's really two parts. It's really, what do we solve to get um, savings needed in the current year, the current upcoming year, fiscal year 21 with these, uh, savings that we're working on, but a whole other set of groups that would be working at this summer and into the fall, looking at things that could be deployed to look at savings on a more systemic or structural level for future years. Slide. And how this comes together with this institutional challenge that is not um, inconsequential, uh, if you could keep clicking through. So the president's work group recommendations from what the work group that Ken and I co-chair are tying together with the president's work group recommendations on academic research, which is uh, chaired by, co-chaired by Provost Croson and Vice President Kramer, working in work group savings across this whole institution. Um, and each unit has different work that they're doing to bring these savings together. And how do we pull this together across all the units? Meaning we have 50 resource responsibility centers across this entire University of Minnesota. And how do we pull this together to bring a comprehensive institutional solution? As you may recall, President Gable gave us a June 1 deadline for our reports. And it would be our intent to bring this work to the board in June as part of the final approval of the FY21 budget, understanding these other efforts that are underway to not just mitigate challenges we may face yet this year, but also help the fiscal sustainability of this institution in years ahead. Um, so with that, the next slide, please. This is the resolution we will be asking you to consider and voting on in June, not today. And as in years past, the CAB will include all of these things in the whereas's and all of the attachments are 
generally included in uh, to the resolution that are in your docket to uh, lay out the tuition rates, the course fees, the academic fees, sh student services fees, and the fund forecasts around central distributed and attributed funds. And with Mr. Chairman um, and members of the committee, we're happy to take your thoughts, your questions, and your input. If you could move to the next slide. Thank you. All right. A couple of uh, opening thoughts from me. And one, I think you've created a a framework for governance assessment, consideration, and ultimately action that is that is really quite quite good for this situation in which none of us in a, any governance settings probably ever found ourselves. So the tiered approach, while there's probably some on the board who'd like more, some who maybe there's too much detail here, I think the cab, the base, the, the, the uh, consolidated or the COVID adjusted budget is really full of detail. And then it pairs back, I think appropriately so for contingencies one and two. And I know as you go forward and we get into June when a lot of key variables begin to show up that if you know the COVID adjusted budget is clearly not gonna be the go forward strategy, then you'll be refining one and two and perhaps creating another. But I think at this point in time, this gives this board an excellent range of uh, planning tools and consideration framework for us to uh, evolve into June. So that's a general thank you for a lot of work. And I can't even begin to imagine just how much work is, is, is reflected in what you just walked through. A second and more narrow call out here goes to a couple people who I don't think are on the phone. I'm sure one of them isn't, but there's a couple elements of this budget that are easy to overlook or this solution, I should say. And one of them is the driver of our central reserves, which is really the temporary investment pool, which is expertly managed by Stuart Mason and his team. And without the returns that they generated in 2019, um, there's no way you enter this year with a uh, with a central reserve of the size that we have, and that having that kind of powder in the is really really good. So thank you to that team and uh, Brian. I know they roll up under you, but uh, I don't think we often stop and recognize the work they do. Um, and then it's also I think there's a a recognition due here to to advance planning, although nobody last year thought of what we might do that, that an $8 million dry powder reserve coming out of the uh, biennial budget last year would ever have been used in the manner it's probably going to be used. Thank goodness it's there. So uh, to the prior administration and the people who are here from that time, I'm really glad we have that. It isn't you know a big enough piece to solve everything, but it coupled with with central reserves give us some uh, some of the strength you talked about, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett. So enough from me. I'm going to uh, turn now to to my colleagues and uh, and here's here's the evolution of the uh, the alphabetic uh, process. I'm going to we we picked on Regent Anderson to go first last time. I'm going to shift to uh, the next uh, person in line. That's Regent Beeson, and uh, item three will be Regent Davenport, and item. Four will be uh, Regent Ahur, if you don't get my drift here. So just to uh, alert everybody. And with that, uh, my vice chair, who's been uh, extremely helpful as we've worked through uh, the budget development and planning process, uh, Regent Beeson, you uh, have the virtual floor here. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I certainly agree with uh, all of your comments. And, and um, uh, I want to thank the presenters and the people that have been um, um, behind uh, all the work. I want to make an initial comment. I've been thinking about this morning's discussion on enrollment strategy, and I just want to put it out there on the record. Uh, I think we should look at doing a, an additional incentive for our Western Minnesota campuses, Morris and Crookston, in the form of a $1,000 or $2,000 signing payment for students who are thinking about going there, and they should. Uh, but who uh, need a little push to do that 
and as a one-time uh, gesture to, um, to uh, get those kids uh, ready and on the University of Minnesota campuses as well. I'll leave it up to board leadership and the administration whether they want to do it, but from my standpoint, I think it would be appropriate to introduce that. So in times of um, uh, crisis and difficulty, I approach these issues by two things, trying to buy time if we have it, and secondly, breaking these issues apart. And I think, uh, let me address the time issue. We've got about 50 days before the next start, the start of the fiscal year. And that's an eternity in this COVID crisis. Things are changing by the week. And the longer we can wait to make a final decision, the best decision we'll make as it relates to public health. Public health is our number one concern right now. And the closest we can make that decision toward the end of June. And I know this industry tends to move in mass when it likes to, it likes the protection of its peers and the, the, the reinforcement of its, of, uh, of others in the industry. But I think we make a better decision the longer we wait. And so if that means waiting beyond the, our, our June meeting, then so, so be it. I also think we're going to be prepare ourselves for some amendments during the year, particularly January as we course correct. Um, and then, um, and then as it relates to the, the, um, uh, the budget itself, you know, I, this is my 12th budget year. And a few years ago, the board asked for more detail. They asked for more context. They asked for more narrative and they're getting that. And that's really helpful this year again. And um, um, that both sort of, it gives us confidence when we understand better the the, the, uh, the words, the, the explanations behind the, the, uh, the budget, uh, and it, it connects uh, a number of dots. I think um, the framework this year of a baseline budget is really important. This is where it breaks down these decisions. We know we've committed to do a 0% increase in tuition. We know we're going to have investments. We know we're going to have reallocations. So the baseline budget incorporates all that and sort of mentally gets that through the planning system. It doesn't end it. We've also bracketed out the, the, the one and two contingencies, which we know the cost of those will, of what those costs will be. So I like the way this forms up again, as the chair said, uh, it's structurally balanced. There's some leaning on, on central reserves, but it's not an ordinance. We're not, we're not kicking the ball down the field. Uh, if you will, for future uh, uh, future boards. So I like the way it frames up. We've got tough decisions to make, but I think it's very manageable uh, in in the way that we started out the uh, this process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, let's see, on to Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I too have a deep appreciation of the challenge that this work group is facing. It's very difficult work, very short timelines and unknowns and changing conditions. One question I have that sometimes on the cost side ends up being a surprise and I haven't read much about it. And maybe this is for uh, Vice President uh, Horseman. Um, is there any, um, uh, indicator that the cost of health care in terms of the fringe benefit um, might fluctuate, go up, I would guess, if anything. Um, and sometimes that's a surprise. So just asking about that and then thank you. Um, uh, Chair, uh, Chair McMillan, um, Regent Davenport, other regents, uh, I appreciate the question. Our health plan uh, historically has uh, tracked very closely to how we project the total premiums, both for the university and for employees over time. And for a number of years, uh, we had a fairly conservative trend uh, that returned itself to employees with a stable plan design. We currently, as you know from last year's discussion, if you were uh, uh, listening to that discussion last May, we have a trend that is reflected in the budget now, and it is not insignificant, and we are very aware of it. However, unlike maybe 10 years ago, it is not a simple um, change of plan design to curb behavior. 
These are complex issues around high price, but a very effective drugs, both through the pharmacy benefit and through the medical plan. The university was one of the first employers in Minnesota to demand from its health plan that we know by name the drugs that are coming through our medical formulary and we now know that and can track it. We also have a significant level the last two years of high cost, uh, but critically needed care for uh, very ill um, members. And that's less than 1% of our population. And each year that population shifts and transitions. So we're aware of it. We know the time has come to look at plan design, but we also know the problem is, is much bigger than that in the world of healthcare. What we feel fortunate with is we have advisors to our plan like Professor Stephen Schondelmeyer out of pharmacy. And we're asking for additional help as we figure this out from our other academic leaders so we can look at a clean canvas and look at everything from network to plan design to how we access treatment for our employees. Thank you. Anything further, Regent Davenport? No, thank you. All right. Her. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to, to um, Senior Vice President Burnett and your team, thank you so much for your work and effort in putting all of this together. I mean, so, it was a lot of work, so I, I, do, I deeply appreciate it. And uh, it comes across, um, I don't know if you are very confident with it, but it comes across very confident, confidently. Um, I have uh, just gonna share with you just my thinking process, uh, not, not really questions, uh, uh, but just, yeah, just thinking process. I'm just wondering, um, one, <clears throat> my assumption is that we are right currently right now at a, still at a 100% employment rate. I think I don't think we've uh, laid off or furloughed any, any staff. Um, and then just looking at the contingency plans going forward uh, with enrollment not being 100%, when would it be that, uh, that, that, that uh, um, staffing would follow? And then two is um, having said that, I am concerned as last year um, with the reallocation because it seems like in CCC one and two, um, the bulk of how to balance the budget, our confidence in how we're going to balance the budget is really in reallocation and, and at, at which uh, units will that happen and, and how will that happen and, and who will take the, uh, the, 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 the um, undue burden, I suppose. So these are things that I'm thinking about as I'm looking at, at the budget. And, and yeah, we have a lot, a lot of tough decisions to make, but I, I feel, you know, with the, with the expertise and definitely guidance of, of the staff, um, we're, we're, we're going to head on, on, on the right track. So thank you. Was there anybody you wanted to direct that to, or is there anybody in the administration that would like to respond? I think we've picked up your thought process there, but I don't know if you had a question, Regent Hurt. Uh, Mr. Chair, no, I didn't have a question. It's just how I'm sharing, how I'm reading this and looking at it. And, and I appreciate that. I just wanted to be sure. And, 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 and definitely, yeah, I definitely turn to the staff on how, what, what, how they can persuade me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first uh, point I'd like to make is. Uh, I think I made it last uh, in the last meeting too, but I, I think we need to have a contingency for uh, in the event that we would not be returning in the spring, since that's part of this fiscal year or this next fiscal year that we're talking about. And whether you want to have a contingency three and four or just three, three being uh, if there's a four uh, being kind of a slow return to campus in the spring as opposed to just starting in January. And then a four uh, then would be uh, kind of a, a full online uh, spring, just like we're doing now. So I don't know, it'd be helpful to know kind of what, what those numbers look like. Next, if no one wants to answer that question, I'll go on. Uh, why, don't, why don't you go on? Uh, Regent uh, Shu, and then um, when you've got another question, we can uh, 
give, I think, Senior Vice President Burnett an opportunity to respond. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think we should also look at uh, some tuition reduction, uh, whether it's 10 or 20% or, or whatever. I think I said 10 or 20% before. But I think we need to see what that scenario looks like if in the event that we would have to uh, re be reducing uh, the tuition to try and achieve the goals of uh, being full for the, for the next uh, academic year, fall and spring. And I think it's a very important, I, I did make the point last time, I'll make it again, uh, we need to be full. And if we can be more than full, that would be even better, but we need to be full. Um, lastly, uh, I don't really understand how we're going to make this decision, when we're gonna make the decision of which uh, scenario we're actually gonna follow. Uh, is there, a, I know we said sometime in June we would make the decision about when uh, we would go back to in-person uh, learning. But the question is how we're gonna make that. Is that just kind of a budget decision? Uh, we vote on a budget and that's the decision or do we make a decision and then look at the financial, um, the, the various financial uh, aspects related to that decision? So I'm kind of confused as to kind of when that occurs and when we actually approve the budget. Well, before I uh, turn to Senior Vice President Burnett to uh, talk about uh, the work that's probably been done already, but not turned into a budget framework around scenario three. And uh, let me comment on the process piece and then let him embellish. So we have our next board meeting, I believe June 11th, our next scheduled meeting. If uh, any inputs into the budget uh, or any of the key inputs into the planning process, operational, uh, public health, you know, whatever, all the different pieces that are moving were to come to pass in between now and then. I mean, our leadership's already shown a willingness to have a special meeting. I think if something really major came down, they'd do that again, or we would see a, uh, you know, a shift into scenario one um, before the June meeting with ample communication to us, or, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed. We're able to keep the cab budget front and center because uh, we get some positive developments. So my, what I understood Vice President Burnett to say is that uh, they've got those ready and uh, they would continue to refine them as needed and get them to us, uh, you know, well before we need to make, uh, so we can honor our commitment to review and uh, approve in different meetings. So I think if we pivot to one of the other ones, it would be later and uh, and would be based upon developments. But that's my understanding, me answering that as chair of the F&O committee. Let me turn it to the administration and uh, I'm assuming this would be Brian that wants to answer, but President Gable may as well. I'm happy to start, or President Gable. In your right, President Burnett. Got it. Well, um, to those questions, Regent Hsu, um, as, Re as Associate Vice President Tonneson said in our presentation, we believe we can pivot if needed in, into this fall and build a contingency three. If, um, it's just pretty far out there and your knowledge is just not as good as it is where it's close in. And so it would be elements of what's in contingency one and two that we would bring to contingency three and probably have to amp that up further. So um, we certainly can do that. We felt like putting more effort into the cab and into contingency one and two was our best efforts. Um, and then if we needed to start thinking about a contingency three, we have several months before we would get to that. And we would use many of the same levers that would be in contingencies one and two to make a three happen. So that was our rationale. Um, I get that differing people can differ on whether that's appropriate or not, but that was our rationale. To the tuition reduction question, um, 10 to 20% would be somewhere on the order of 90 to $200 million of additional challenge for the university on top of what we've already presented to you. Um, I would note for the com committee and, and um, that we do not know of any of our peers or schools in the country that are reducing tuition in the fall semester. We know of a number that are freezing like you have chosen to do at, our, at the recommendation of President Gable. 
We also know that at least two of our Big Ten peers are increasing tuition this fall due to some of the financial challenges they're faced with. So um, when you think about, I guess from my perspective, when you think about the hard things we've done, um, I think that this is a balanced approach to maintaining the excellence of this university and keeping the talented faculty and staff that are on the front lines of solving COVID, of solving so many other things that I just can't, we did not support a tuition reduction, even though in a perfect world, it would be something that would be obviously helpful to our students. And finally, on when to decide in fall, we did put in the docket, um, I believe it's in there, and I know it's very lengthy at over 400 pages, but I think the idea would be, as Regent Beeson said, waiting as long as we can to make a decision um, and, and using the science and the experts to help make the decision, and the budget is not gonna drive that. The budget is built to respond to the decision made by you, the board, President Gable, in consultation with the governor, and the Minnesota Department of Health. And so we would pivot probably contingency one around um, at least look to make that decision around the 1st of July. Um, and then if we, if, and then we put notionally, but these can move that we might have to pivot to contingency two somewhere in the middle of August. But um, those are very fluid and that's the best estimating we can do as we put this budget together and this docket together about 10 days ago. Um, and I'm happy to have President Gable comment on if I've misspoke on any of those things. No, I agree with everything Senior Vice President Burnett just said. Okay, Regent Chu, any uh, further follow-up? Yeah, I would say that it would be um, a good to have a basic contingency three um, so that we can digest that, start digesting that. Also, the, um, the decision to to go online was made without the board. And um, it was a surprise, I think, that it happened without uh, consultation with the board and board approval. And so I'm, I'm really kind of um, trying to understand how we would make that decision um, to, uh, to go back to uh, in-person learning whenever that should be. And I think that the uh, board should be involved in that instead of um, just having having it made uh, a decision made and communicated to us um, some point after after the fact. So um, yeah, I guess that's all I have for now. I, I would like to see a, a contingency three and um, would like to better understand how we're going to make that decision to go back. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and presenters. Appreciate the, the, the hard work and, and the uncertainty. I feel like every conversation we have, it's just, there's a lot that we don't know. So we appreciate you putting this together, even in that context. Uh, my question is, and you know, maybe it was in there, there's a high chance it was in there and I just didn't find it. But I remember when we talked about the refunds for, for housing and other fees, um, I briefly asked about what our plan was to then do to make those units whole. Um, so for example, that was the refunds, I think were ended up being $35 million. So now we have auxiliary units who are short $35 million short uh, in comparison to what they had budgeted and planned for. Is that something that's gonna be addressed in the annual budget uh, the same way? I did see a line item for 12.5 million in response to COVID and um, we talked about library admissions, uh, law, and some other units receiving kind of uh, one-time support. So for the auxiliary units um, that had to refund those fees, um, are they being made whole here, or is that in a, in a separate conversation, or, or is that not going to happen at all? Associate Vice President Tonneson, perhaps? or Senior Vice President Burnett, whatever. Regent Kenyana, I, and when I, the very first slide in the presentation talked about wrapping up FY20. And we talked about walking through and using the steps we laid out in, on April 7th about how we would make the auxiliaries whole, that we largely see this as an FY20 issue, the current year we're in. And our goal would be to work through May and June with all our auxiliaries to get them addressed with that, those seven steps we put in the April 7th, where external funds, 
balances, central reserves. And then that's why we're recommending 25 million to help those auxiliaries cover those refunds that they couldn't afford to cover. And that's what we laid out when you voted on the refunds. And that's what we laid out because we're really, un unlike most years, we're really talking about how do we wrap up fiscal year 20 that's taken a whack. And, and yet really this presentation is about FY21. So we can certainly spend an additional time with you, but it was in that very first slide of this presentation that Pre Associate Vice President Tonis and I largely did that we would address those things and we would bring a report back to the board of how we addressed each and every auxiliary because there are dozens, if not approaching a hundred of them across the university. Uh, thank you, Vice President. That answers the question, Mr. Chair. Anything else, Regent Kenyanya? Not at the moment, thank you. Okay, Regent Mayron. Yes, thank you. Um, in the presentation at slide 134, we, you talk about uh, it has to do with compensation changes for fiscal year 2021. It indicates that included within the uh, COVID adjusted budget, it includes implementation of the approved collective bargaining uh, agreement. So that's uh, being absorbed in that budget. When we go to slide 142, uh, and there you're laying out uh, as we, uh, m what we might have to address on a going forward basis in the event that we hit contingencies one or two. You list under there, currently considering temporary payroll uh, savings across all employee groups. My question is, uh, with respect to the collective bargaining agreements, I, I recognize their agreements and they have contractual provisions, but uh, is it contemplated that we may go back to those unions and to work with them or request and try and negotiate with them uh, payroll reductions? Is that, are they included within that concept or are when we talk about temporary payroll savings across all employee groups is the assumption that the collective bargaining groups are not a group that we would be approaching to try and resolve the deficit. That's my first question. Go ahead. Chair McMillan, uh, Regent Mayeron, I can <clears throat> try to answer that. To this point, uh, our message to our labor represented employees and their representatives have been that we will, uh, we will honor those uh, obligations and those contracts. The temporary payroll savings we are considering would be across those uh, employee groups that do not, uh, are not represented by collective bargaining. And we feel at this point uh, that the range that we uh, anticipated uh, could be achieved through that. Uh, we also have a principle that there is a certain threshold uh, of lower income employees that we will try to exempt from those actions and tier those uh, actions actually towards those that earn more. Uh, so that's the approach we're looking at at the present time. And uh, my second question has to do actually with the next slide. It's slide 143, the, um, the, the final slide of this, uh, or the second to final slide of this pack. Um, the institutional dollar challenge and uh, the, the various work groups and the units one through 50. Um, perhaps uh, Vice President uh, Burnett, is there a way to give us an example? I'm not quite sure how this works or, or what's contemplated um, by these uh, work groups and these units of one through 50 in terms of what this might entail. Thank you, uh, Regent Maron, members of the committee. What we're talking about is our committee's putting together overarching um, potentially recommendations if we did an across the board furlough or temporary pay cut that we're, we've been talking about just conceptually, that would help each of our units because it would be something across the board or universal. What we were trying to show in this graphic was that'll be a tool that they don't have right now that they can apply to help meet 
the budget challenge in contingency one or contingency two. Um, and so it's applied differently, but it would be something that if we said, we're gonna do this across the entire workforce, then that's a new tool that our deans or our chancellors have that they don't have right now once we come to a consistent approach, which is what President Gable um, wants us to work through and the administration wants us to work through in a consistent approach on some of these overarching challenges. So I think what we are trying to show there is that these would be applied in each unit, but each unit has different levels of employment and has different levels of salary. So this becomes a tool for them. And, and what I would just say is stay tuned. We will bring you more details in June as we put this together. Um, because we, our committee has been at it for about three and a half weeks. We're making very good progress, but that's the, that's the big idea. And I hope I'm explaining that clearly for you. Okay, thank you, you have. I don't have any further questions, thank you. Regent uh, Mayor, uh, thank you. Before I go to Regent Powell, I'm gonna insert a, uh, a clarifying question that Regent Mayor's question about the, uh, our, uh, our, our union employee commitments brought up. And this, I'm gonna state this, but I'm doing so in the form of a question. I believe we have meet and confer requirements in each of of our labor agreements and isn't it still an opportunity even if we don't look at pay rate changes which are defined in those contracts to look at uh, how we might uh, you know look at furloughs or reductions those sort of things and again I'm not hinting that that's any higher priority than anything else but as the committee goes forward senior vice president Burnett I assume you would you know those meet and confer opportunities might leave places where you could look for cost savings there too. Is that true? Yes, sir. And I would ask uh, Interim Vice President Horseman just to comment briefly. We, we do have the ability to talk about it, but we built this base budget assuming we were honoring Understood. all contracts. So Sen Interim Vice President Horseman, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, Chair McMillan, uh, Regents. It is, we are required to meet and confer uh, for various um, decisions and, and furloughs are one of them, whether it's a broad furlough that would apply uh, as part of this solution, or if we have a local situation that is due to lack of work, we must communicate that we are going to meet and confer and uh, have that formal session. So that is something that will likely uh, be part of the process as we move forward and have these uh, situations arise. Thank you. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. Uh, just a few brief comments that are going to echo some things that have already been said. I'll be very, very brief. First of all, I want to um, just uh, express my appreciation to uh, Senior Vice President Burnett and AVP Tonneson. I think this is a really, really good st structure and it's really well thought through. Uh, and you know, in, in a difficult situation, and I, I do think the idea of let's start with what we know, or are pretty sure with what we know, and then and then build off of that with contingencies is is a very good approach. And frankly, as you read about uh, businesses around town um, and other large organizations, everyone is really taking this approach that you know certainty isn't an option here right now. Let's give ourselves permission to adjust on the fly. And, um, uh, and, you know, uh, we'll know a lot more a month or two months from now. So I, I, I really do think that's the right way to go. The second point I want to make is that al although this is a very challenging situation and, you know, we could be off three, four or five percent in revenue, uh, I suspect there are quite a few big organizations in town that would trade places with that, with tra trade places with us on that if that's what we uh, if that, uh, what this ends up being, I do think that this is manageable and, uh, uh, and, and we've, we've seen a good blueprint for how to manage it. I also think we should look at it as primarily, I mean, this is a, gonna be a one year problem. And I, I'm, I'm willing to predict that a year from now when we're sitting here, this will be in our rear view mirror and, and we'll be thinking about how do we really go hard to you know, come out of this strong and recover strongly and take advantage of you know all the great capabilities that we have as a great institution. So you know this is a one-year thing. Let's not do any harm as we as we think about um, you know uh, getting from now to a year from now. 
And then finally, I just want to echo, I mean, a number of people have talked about interim VP Horseman and, and, and Senior Vice President Burnett and their commitment to look for other longer term efficiencies um, and longer term uh, uh, productivity opportunities. I think that is really, really important. And it's been mentioned a couple times and uh, I'm sure we'll come back to it. I do think it's an important aspect of this whole situation. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Regent Powell. I am uh, sorry, stepped away for just a moment. Uh, next on the list is Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and you missed out. It was it was a touching and brilliant statement by Regent Powell, but I think you can watch it online later. I heard it. I just didn't see it all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of a couple of items here. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm. A little bit concerned about the timing, and I'd actually be interested in in, in understanding um, what kinds of conversations have occurred. You know, right now the big wild card, I think, um, for much of what we're talking about in these plans, is what's going to happen at the state. And um, I thought that it was maybe a little. I, I think we should have maybe a little bit more uh, of an eye toward potential on allotment concerns. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but we just had the report come out where the state went from a, a you know two billion dollar roughly surplus to a, um, a two billion dollar deficit to try to cover. Um, and I think we at least have to be mindful of the fact that that could have a pretty profound impact on us. And 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 where I bring that up in relation to the stuff that's before us, and I think it's you know obviously very unique work, and it's it's uh, it's it's very um, robust process and information in front of us for us to consider. Uh, but you know, we start talking about June and after that in, in this in this discussion, and the legislature is already going to have taken care of its business. And and so um, you look at some of the the various pressures that would have us giving a very positive report on where we are, where we're not going to have a, a, a huge issue, um, particularly as it relates to this board's um, uh, determinations on on how to. Uh, do the things that I think Regent Powell just cautioned us against doing, which is overreacting. Uh, but at the same time, um, if, if we're demonstrating to the world that, hey, things are great, um, and, you, and you're a legislator and you're talking about all kinds of entities that you need to fund, many of which are really hurting and have constituencies that are hurting even more, um, where are you going to make the cut? You know, if, if the university is, is saying things are fine um, and these other important uh, legislative priorities are, 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 are struggling, we may find ourselves in, in a, a difficult position based on um, a reduction in, in what we had already anticipated coming in the door. Um, and so I don't know if, 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 if President Gable, if you, if Mr. Burton, I, I don't know that he's available here for this, this dialogue, but have we been having conversations with legislative leaders on um, what's going on? I mean, I you know certainly they have a, a, a strong interest. I, I don't know that I've ever met a legislator that doesn't have an interest in, in how we're um, treating our, our students, particularly resident students, on, on tuition um, as we go forward. What's our goal in terms of educating their constituents? Have we had those conversations with legislative leaders to understand as this as this fight becomes, I think, you know, for state resources becomes more intense in, in the coming weeks? Uh, do we know where we stand and are we taking, and, and is this approach um, putting us in a good position to ensure that we get as, as much support or retain as much support from the state as we possibly can? President Gable. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan, Regent Rocha. Yes, we are in continuous conversation with um, party leadership, committee leadership, uh, the commissioners, um, on all fronts, as you know, we're directly involved as scholars and experts on what we're doing on the public health side. Um, we have been in regular communication in ways that yielded the partnered support with Mayo for the testing that all went through state government, governor's office and commissioners. And we have been talking with um, party leadership and committee leadership about budgeting in addition to the commissioner's office there. Um, as far as we know, no one has been told by the state um, any specifics around cuts. The state um, has just made this projection announcement just a couple of days ago, although uh, uh, we all anticipated that the news would be somewhere in the range of what they suggested. They have not made their plans yet. So we have no information, and from what we understand, no one else does either, about how the state intends to respond to the information that they 
have now just made available. But what we've explained to the state is essentially what we've just explained to you with, with less detail, which is we're not fine. We have a plan. It's an extremely challenging plan. Uh, and we will do what we need to do in order to curate the mission and conti continue to fulfill the service that we undertake to the state. But that we are presuming that we will be able to do so with their partnership and support. Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. If I may. Yes, please, Mr. Or uh, Regent Rowe. Thank you. Um, and you know, I, I thank you, President Gable. And again, it's, you know, but it, there, it, it, we're gonna be looking across a lot of different um, elements and, and our, 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 our fellow um, public higher ed institutions and in, in the Minnesota state side, you know, we're, we're kind of been watching to see what's happening there in terms of how things are happening with personnel and otherwise, because um, I think those things are all going to be signals as to the direness of need, and, and we'll, we'll have to see where that goes as we go. A, a couple more real quick points on that. Uh, Regent Shu brought up the, the, the issue of uh, online versus not online, and, and you know, we I think we did a wonderful job of making the transition to online in terms of from a technical component. Obviously, this had been a conversation that we'd been having for a number of years where we were, you know, where it was understood that um, it, it, it was a virtually uh, a very difficult task, we'll call it that, to, to, to increase our online um, offerings. And, and, and so I'm glad to see that, that we were able to overcome that previous reservation. But as it relates to the board being involved in that dialogue, I, you know, I think that's a, a function of our written policy. Um, it would be a, a, a board um, conversation that, that would be appropriate based on public interest, based on reputational risk, particularly as you're dealing with a pandemic. So I would, I would ask, you know, and certainly hope that, that the, the entire board, which is the only authority to act on behalf of the board in that case, would be, uh, would be a part of those continuing conversations, which again, it, you know, it seems like the plain language of the, of the policy of, of public interest would, would uh, require that. And then finally, I'll just say that when we talk about the student issues, I, I was you know, pleased to hear um, Regent Beeson talking about incentivizing students um, in, on, our, uh, on, on some of our campuses. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's really important for so many reasons, uh, obviously just the economic part of it. Um, but I think that we have to look at this, um, you know, you, I think to some extent, we as a board have to decide where our priority is um, in, in multiple ways. Um, you know, if, if we, if we want to maintain uh, these, you know, fairly um, you know, rigid uh, objective standards in, in, in some respects for the, the broadest number of students, you know, trying to find a way of, of attracting folks to campus with, with reduced tuition, with more aggressive pricing to fill the seats um, may make sense. If, if we're not willing to do that, then you would maybe cast a wider net. Uh, to a broader number of students, students that are certainly going to have the capacity to succeed if we meet them where they are, uh, students with uh, uh, competent ACTs and good GPAs um, that, that as of right now are maybe not being admitted, uh, but, but certainly would be very interested in attending their state land grant university. So um, I, I, I just, you know, we'll talk more about it I, perhaps tomorrow, but, but I really do believe that we need to uh, um, uh, maximize uh, our enrollment, make sure that we continue to do that um, to demonstrate that value um, and, and also just the economic benefit of, of keeping those, those spots filled. Um, that is all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Rosha. And I'm gonna, because I appreciate the dialogue you've, you've opened here about the, the uh, you know, how is this, how is our fiscal situation viewed at the other end of University Avenue, if I think about uh, Minneapolis um, and going to St. Paul, outside of Aiken County where I'm looking right now, I believe that, that there is an, an element of confidence in how this is put together, confidence that we have the resources, tools and expertise and experience to move forward. But I wouldn't by any means say it's confidence without a considerable amount of, and tremendous amount of, of uh, cutting and uh, pain the, the numbers that are in the two scenarios, 125, I think, and 142, coupled with, I think we're down 73 this fiscal year, and uh, the COVID adjusted basis has another 53, if I'm remembering my numbers right. You know, you put either the 2021 or a couple of 2020 with the 2021 fiscal year numbers, and, uh, you know, we're up against some really, really difficult challenges. So I hope our friends in the legislature appreciate that while we may 
speak with some confidence that we can find a way through this. We aren't by any means confident about the fact that this is going to be easy. And I believe Senior Vice President Burnett has said several times in the context of these discussions that the single most important element of our confidence comes from assurances that the state allocation shows up every month and then nothing is more sacred to us than, than that. I'll let him comment before we go to Regent Simonson, but I do appreciate the, the spirit of the comments you offered. I just hope nobody's you know reading the fact that our leadership team and, and you know, sees, sees a path here as, oh, this is easy because it's really, really, really gonna be hard and there's a lot of heavy lifting in the middle of uh, those two joint uh, work groups that that uh, President Cables presented, and I would expect over the next month we're going to start to see just how, you know, hard that's going to be. So, um, I don't know that that really requires an additional comment, Senior Vice President Burnett. Let's keep moving. And uh, um, so, I didn't mean to that as a rebuttal in any way, Regent Roche. I just wanted to tell you I appreciate what you were saying and uh, thought I'd add my own as committee chair to that. Um, my own thoughts and recognition of what you said is, is important to consider. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair McMillan. And thank you, presenters. I appreciate all the work that's been done. Uh, obviously, you aren't staying home watching a lot of TV like some of us. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate the three scenarios uh, for the fiscal year 21 and the future year and then the savings. And I, I do agree with Regent Powell. I think we'll be looking at this in the rearview mirror in another year. I think the stuff that's uh, happening as far as vaccines and treatments, and especially at our great university, all that stuff is happening, testing, et cetera. I think we're gonna be looking at, <clears throat> at this in the rearview mirror. But going to the current budget and, and at the current 20 budget and the current uh, proposed budget, um, <clears throat> this is my second uh, 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 budget process I've been involved with. And looking at the uh, table three, page uh, 58, uh, I remember looking at the first one a couple of years ago, the first budget, I saw the same thing and, it, and the question came to me. Uh, 25, roughly 25% of the uh, uh, revenues are tuition and about 7% uh, fall into grants contracts and stuff like that. That bothered me from the first time and I, I'm still interested in that. Uh, I'd like to see, you know, over time, and I understand this timing right now may be difficult, but I'd like to see it to stay on the agenda and be thought about. So that 25% comes down, 7% goes up. Uh, more details on, on revenue growth is kind of where I'm at anyway. Looking forward, looking forward to the overall strategic plan that we talked about a few months ago. And I understand that's gotten delayed, but I was really looking forward, especially to senior Vice President Kramer's five-year plan. I think he said on revenue growth, he was looking from the office of OTC, he was looking at about a 40% growth. And, and so I understand that's that sidelined right now, but I think it's still something we need to keep on the docket and, and not, uh, and, and we still have OTC, board, I think they're still working. And so I'd like to see uh, how they're involved in this process going forward and more details on revenue. So that's my basic comment. Thank you, Regent Simonson. The last one of the senior team wants to respond. I'd move on to Regent Swigum, but I'll stop for a moment to see if uh, President Cable or Senior Vice President Burnett have a response. Hi. Chair McMillan, um, Regent Simonson, we, uh, the strategic plan is, is not actually delayed. Uh, we'll be discussing it at length tomorrow. Um, the uh, components specifically that you address are um, remain uh, intact from the plan that Vice President Kramer presented to you. Um, the system level strategic plan presumes that the office of the vice president of research, that his plan is incorporated and we can go into detail on that tomorrow. Uh, but um, there are opportunities for um, tech transfer and commercialization to help solve some of our problem. But apropos to some of our previous comments, 
the only way that that work happens is if we have the resources to invest in our innovators and in the ecosystem of our students, faculty, and staff who engage in discovery in the way that the state's only research university can. And so that, uh, that work is critically important. It remains a priority. There's nothing about our current circumstances that changes that. And if anything, it, it goes back to um, an attribute of the conversation, in my opinion, that we had with Regent Rocha that um, reflects the fact that while we have a plan and we will cope, um, if we want to retain quality, uh, we need to remain strongly partnered with the state and with the federal funding agencies who have seen the benefits of what it means to have a research university of our quality and impact right here. Thank you. Thank you, President Gilbert. Okay, I've got uh, Regent Swigum, Regent Anderson, and then our student representatives. So, uh, Regent Swigum. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe a little different perspective uh, as to the CAB budget and the contingencies. Um, <clears throat> and first of all, I, I've asked my Senior Vice President Burnett, I think three times, if the uh, base budget is realistic or not. And he has assured me from his perspective, it is realistic. It's realistic with, you know, now a couple contingencies, one and two, I'm, I'm potentially on top of it. My perspective is this, any good basketball or football coach knows you got to enter into a game with a plan. You also know that that plan is probably going to change because the other team is going to play defense and they're going to move you off your plan. They're going to do something different. So you have to have flexibility and you got to be able to, uh, to, to change that plan. Um, I think with contingency one and two, uh, as difficult as they would be, we, we have an opportunity to look at potentially changing a plan if necessary. I don't think it's going to be necessary. And my perspective is this, that the, 12 of us as leaders and more with, with the, uh, the vice presidents, we're, we're in a position where, where we have to uh, make the best decision we can with the, the information we have before us right now and, and portray what I would call hope to our, to our students and to our faculty and to the university. Um, that's why I don't think we need to go beyond a contingency you know, $271 million contingency two on top of our base plan, uh, very, very extremely, extremely uh, challenging as the president said, but if you go beyond that, it's extremely difficult. And, and I just think that we're in that position, making good decisions, making a plan that's flexible, uh, but, but also knowing um, that we're there to, you know, provide some as leadership, some degree of hope and, and not, some fear and anxiety that is probably not going to be realistic or take place. So I'm, I'm good, Mr. Chairman, with the uh, budget presented by, by Brian Burnett as being a realistic plan for our university to continue our mission and bring hope to our, to our, to our students and the mission that, that we're to serve. That's all I need to say. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Regent Anderson, you've been patiently you, waiting uh, at the end of the alphabet. I I'm patiently waiting. I, again, I went from first to last in the space of like two hours. Um, <laughs> it happens all the time. Story of my life. Uh, I, I will just tell you that um, I like the process we're doing. I think there's tremendous amount of effort that has went into it. Um, I think whatever happens, we are going to be better in the long run for going through these exercises. I also think that this COVID-19 will cause structural financial change in academia going forward. And so doing these exercises now is a good idea. Um, I really agree with Regent Beeson when I'm of the opinion that people want to get back, the, the students I've talked to and the parents I've talked to want to get back to some sense of normalcy on college campuses next year. And I, I think Regent Beeson is, is right on that he's, you know, I call it, we, we don't really need to be uh, uh, peered into being in a hurry. We got, you know, some time to make the decisions. Let's not hurry. I, I think the, um, I love the idea 
of filling the hole in the 2020 budget and going forward with a blank slate and having a new budget for 2021. Uh, we talked about debt, we talked about other things, but if we can fill the budget with central reserves and some other things for this year, put it behind us and go forward, I think that's good. I think the budget is optimistic, but I think is realistic. And, and there's an agreement with, with Regent Rocha also in that, and, and as, as Regent Spigum just said, we need to be flexible because if our partners at the state are not gonna be partners, then the budget's somewhat fragile, but we have to, we can't look at that now. We have to have the flexibility to change down the road and hope they can, they wanna continue to be partners with us. They've got difficult decisions to make too. Um, I, the only thing that does surprise me is we talked earlier and I remember the March meeting allocating $5 million for the president at her discretion to fill any holes. And we thought the, the amounts by the end of this fiscal year would be quite high. I assume the 25 million that we are gonna be asking for, that the, the board will be asked for, doesn't cover what our deficits will be. It is, or does it? No, that's just a plug in. And with the other things you put on there, we can get to putting that in the rear view mirror. Thank you. I see Julie nodding her head, so I'm seeing that. that that's, yeah, I thought I thought it would be a lot more and we weren't gonna be able to get there, but I'm really fortunate that we are. So I don't need a comment on that. I uh, just appreciate what you people working on these budgets and working on scenarios have done. And I think I think we've got a great plan to, to move forward, so thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Uh, student Representative Batin. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. I have a couple questions. Um, the first is kind of a, it's a very small one, but um, on page 103 of the docket, um, line 33 of the budget, as a professional student, I'm curious to see about <laughs> the four cent drop in the professional student uh, fee when all else are stable and what it seems like it doesn't amount to much so I'm just curious about it um the the bigger question that I have and this is to senior VP Burnett and associate VP Tonneson talking about the confidence level of the the cab and the contingencies um where would you put those confidence levels and you know how did how would you arrive at those um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'll have, we'll, we may have to get back to you on exactly what's going on, but uh, Associate Vice President Tonneson may know about the element of uh, page 103, Julie. Uh, sure, um, Mr. Chair, Student Representative Batin. I, you know, we will get back to you on it, but my sense is that those numbers are, there's a lot of uh, sort of math behind them that isn't, it isn't a decision about how the funds will be used. It has to do with the number of students that are in the base and so on and so forth. There's math behind there, but we can get back to you with the specifics. To your second question, and I ask Associate Vice President Tonneson to um, comment as well. That's a great question about confidence level. Um, each day we get more confident in the cab and you heard data this morning um, from Vice Provost McMaster and Provost Croson, um, that summer enrollments are actually looking stronger this summer than last summer. That, if that, if we come to even being level with last summer, gives us great confidence that we've modeled this correctly. And um, we keep making progress every day on fall enrollments across our five campuses. So each day, I would say we get more confident about it. Um, contingency one and contingency two, what I've noticed, and uh, just to comment as the co-chair of one of the committees, is just an amazing willingness of faculty, students, staff to say, we're all in this together. We're going to figure this out together. And if we all have to share some pain to get there, um, to keep this university vibrant, um, the, the esprit de corps has been just... Um, amazing to be able to be a part of. And so I guess, and Associate Vice President Tonneson has been here 
much longer than I have, but, and been through a lot of budget challenges at this university. But I would tell you that um, we, 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 feel, we feel confident. We wouldn't bring this forward to the board if we did not feel confidence. And each day, I think we feel more confident about it given what's going on with our folks in admissions and the hardworking folks around our campuses getting this class. Julie? Uh, the only thing I would add to that is the, the, it isn't, it, I agree with the enrollment pieces and feeling more confident about what is happening there with the continuing students or retention and so forth. The other piece though we have to rem remember is that a big piece of the impact isn't about students. It's actually for the university's budget about all the other activities we are engaged in and whether or not those activities can continue. I still feel very confident in the CAB because we were, I would say a little bit conservative about those activities coming back online. So the, the way that um, it, and again, I'm more confident every day because they're really working hard to get the clinics going and to think about how we can operate with our activities. Um, so I don't think, you know, I think that's the piece that there is more uncertainty around but I still feel confident in what we've presented because I feel like we have been a little conservative on that as well, so. All right, thank you both. I'm gonna move on to our, uh, our last uh, member of our, of our questions here, the last person to provide questions, student representative Tojo Garcia. Do you want to, uh, do you have anything for us? Yes, I do. Thank you, Chairman. All right. And, and thank Proceed. you, presenters. Um, I think my question is for Senior Vice President Burnett or Associate Vice President Tonneson. Um, earlier today during the Mission Fulfillment Committee, Regent Shu alluded to the idea that reducing tuition could help to attract more students to the University of Minnesota next year. Uh, during the same meeting, it was discussed that the university's enrollment situation may be particularly fragile uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, especially with respect to students and their families' ability to afford coming back in the fall. Uh, as Vice President Burnett mentioned, the University of Minnesota has a unique opportunity here to be a leader, not only among the Big Ten, but also nationally. Uh, could you speak a little bit to the feasibility of that? Mr. Chair, yes, thank you, Student Representative. I, I um, touched on it before, but I guess I will say um, I feel comfortable with where we sit on our tuition piece, particularly when you consider that we're going to have a big mix change in the number of international students, we're projecting the, the fewer uh, non-resident, non-reciprocity students, and we have to factor that into our equation as well. And so that's going to be another revenue challenge that we have put into this budget. But I think that, um, uh, again, there's a balance, right? I mean, certainly it would be great if we could reduce tuition, but I think when you think about the challenges we face already, um, the number of things we're trying to do to ask people to make sacrifices to make this work, I think overall a tuition freeze is much more responsible. It's much more balanced. Um, and, and when you consider that, that I think enrollment continues to look strong for summer and, and continues to look better each day for fall, at least in most cases, I, I feel like we're in a really good spot and a lot of institutions followed us with the tuition freeze and again, a couple of our peers are, are going, are adding to tuition costs this fall and have announced it. So um, I think on balance, my answer to you would be in this plan that we put together in these uncertain times, I think the, the balance it, that we've struck in this budget pr presentation um, is the best I can do for maintaining excellence and keeping what students expect out of the University of Minnesota in our classrooms and laboratories. Thank you. Is that, uh, is that it, uh, Student Representative Tojo Garcia? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Okay, all right. We have uh, no action before us on this items, but we do have a capital budget um, item to consider next. That's review, not action. And then we have action on real estate. We have uh, information items and we have a content agenda. Knowing that we've been at this to well, coming up on three hours here. I'm going to take a five minute break, but it's got to be, you know, policed really well, police yourselves. So take a break, but plug your devices in so nobody fades away on us in the last uh, 
the last round and we'll get through the rest of this. So five minutes, which puts us at um, just a couple minutes before three, okay? Not three, but three minutes to three. Thank you.
Judge McMillan, you can go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for taking a very short break, but we've got still some key things to do. Our third item of business today is review of the President's recommended fiscal year 2021 annual capital improvement budget. Like the operating budget, we'll act on this next month at our regular June meeting. And with that said, I think President Gabel, Senior Vice President Burnett, and Vice President Bertelsen are here to talk to us about the capital improvement budget, which, of course, in a world where we're looking for a bonding bill, probably is full of uncertainty, like the last topic. President Gabel? Chair McMillan, can you all, pardon me, but can you all see me? I can hear you. I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but I think in the interest of time, I probably ought to just proceed and hopefully... We can hear you just fine, so... Good. Well, thank you very much, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson. As part of the Board of Regents policy, the administration is directed to develop a capital budget with a six-year time horizon updated annually. The total fiscal year 2021 capital budget is $423.6 million and takes into account our state capital request, which includes over $317 million in state capital request projects, including the Twin Cities Child Development Replacement, A.B. Anderson Hall in Duluth, and chemistry and clinical research facilities on the Twin Cities campus. Our fiscal year 2021 capital budget also reflects the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on auxiliary units, with cancellation or deferment of approximately $22 million in planned capital renewal projects in order to preserve cash and mitigate revenue losses. Members of the committee, we're heading into the final week of the Minnesota legislative session, and state lawmakers are completing negotiations on a capital investment bonding bill that would fund critical infrastructure projects across the state, including these buildings and other investments at the University of Minnesota. We believe that a capital investment in the university is an investment in our state. It is an investment in our students who become workforce-ready graduates and leaders. It's an investment in discovery and research and in cures by our world-class faculty who transform our state and society, and that has never been clearer than it is right now. It's an investment in our critical infrastructure, shoring up our buildings while putting money directly in the hands of local contractors who work on projects across all of our campuses. We look forward to the legislature's action this week. And Mr. Chair, with that, I'll turn it over to Senior Vice President Burnett and Vice President Mike Bertelsen to discuss the details. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to continue. As the President noted, if we can move to the next slide, please. The Board of Regents policy does direct the administration to develop a capital budget with a six-year time horizon, and we update that annually. And in May and June, the Board reviews and approves the annual capital improvement budget for the next fiscal year. And the presentation today covers the projects we'll be undertaking in the coming year. You've seen these before. And this six-year capital improvement plan serves as the foundation for our major capital investments. We will revisit this plan in the fall when it's been updated and brought to you for review and action. Next slide, please. And just a reminder for the members of the committee, year one of the six-year capital plan is what we would be bringing forward. It does include any project over a million dollars. They need to have a completed pre-design, and they must be fully funded before we bring them to you. And approved projects then move into design and or construction, and then there's different stages like schematic design where we bring up those items back before the Board in the normal process. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Vice President Bertelsen, assuming his Wi-Fi is stable and working. And if not, I will pinch it for him. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right. Very good. Slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a breakdown of the broad categories in the annual capital budget. As you can see, we rely on the state for about 75% of our capital funding. Next slide. One important point of information for the Board regarding the budget document before you today is that because the legislature is in session and still working on the bonding bill, we are including the full value of our state request at this time. We will adjust this in June 
based upon final actions by the state. Next slide. For your reference, these are the projects included in our current state capital request, which the board approved in October. The state request represents 88% of the annual capital budget. If there were no bonding bill, the FY21 capital budget would be down to about $51 million. Next slide. There's a lot to look at at this slide. The key points are that facility renewal is a predictable and ongoing need as buildings age, but most of our funding for renewal is dependent upon unpredictable state bonding bills. For us to maintain our current facility condition, we need to annually invest between the two gray lines, which is how we get to our $200 million state uh, EPER request. We would need to exceed the top gray line in order to make progress to reduce our $4.8 billion renewal need. The annual stewardship or the maroon bars represents HEPR and r, r The asset reinvestment or the gold bars represent all other facility renewal. Next slide, please. HEPR legislation provides strict guidelines on the type of projects that can be funded. Funds are intended to preserve and renew existing campus facilities by funding five kinds of projects, accessibility, building systems, energy efficiency, health and safety, and infrastructure. The tagline HEPR is cheaper is, and true, is indeed true and the most cost-effective way we can care for our buildings. Next slide. We have a large list of projects that, would, that we would tackle with $200 million of HEPR. In the end, the project list would be scaled to match the funding available. Many of the larger high-impact HEPR projects like Duluth Chemistry Building Renewal or mechanical engineering phase three in the Twin Cities campus will not be feasible without a large bonding bill. Next slide. In addition to the state request projects, this slide also lists the major university funded programmatically driven projects. For FY21, there are three such projects outside of the state capital request, microbial cell production, Lind Hall renovation, and MCT or molecular and cellular therapeutics renovation. Next slide. The capital budget also includes several R&R pools. These are funds that are used to tackle many projects such as elevator upgrades, HVAC and mechanical equipment replacement and so forth. Projects within these pools can shift in priority based on their criticality or balances remaining when the projects come in under budget. Of specific note has been the president identified $21.5 million of R&R was deferred due to COVID primarily in auxiliary units. In addition, the housing and dining project on the Duluth campus is nearing completion of the design phase, but being paused until we have more clarity about the financial impact to auxiliaries on the Duluth campus. Next slide. I would like to make note of a number of projects that you may see added to the capital budget in June or at some point during the coming fiscal year. These are projects that we are currently working on, but have not yet met the readiness threshold for inclusion in the capital budget. A special note for the microbial cell production facility, $3 million is included in this budget for design, but the total project cost is estimated at $59.6 million. We anticipate bringing the balance of the project funding for approval once the scope and budget are finalized. And we hope to, that you can expect to see this project back on the docket in December as a capital budget amendment. Next slide. This slide provides a summary of the funding sources. As a reminder, this includes the full value of the state capital request. Next slide, please. The university debt components of this proposed budget include financing the university's share of the projects included in the state capital request, plus the microbial production facility. That concludes our presentation and I'm glad to take questions. Okay, thank you to uh, each of you and Noting that uh, we obviously don't have a key element in the ingredient here, namely the, the state legislature. Um, I open it up for questions and uh, it's okay to pass if you don't have any. So I'm gonna start now as I promised with Regent Davenport who uh, is next in my rotating uh, alphabetical selection process here. It's not random. Regent Davenport. 
Thank you, Chair McMillan. That's a, a good program of work and I have no questions. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Regent Hur. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Vice President Burnett and Burlington. I have a question with regards to the capital um, bonding language. What is the, um, what is, I know we're not certain, but what what do they have allocated for uh, for us currently? Mr. Chairman, um, Regent Her, we have not, at least I have not seen anything as of yet from the legislature. They are still in discussions, but we have presented the entire list for the regents. Um, the fifth one, the cl clinical research facility, we've been advocating about refinancing the biodiscovery debt that you gave us approval to ask the legislature for. And it's my understanding that bill may be moving in Senate finance either today or tomorrow, but we have not been privy to any lists yet from formally from any legislators. Okay, thank you. Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no comments or questions. Okay, thank you. Regent Kenyanya? Uh, Mr. Chair, I've been notified that it's okay to pass. <laughs> and you're taking full advantage of that. I'm going to exercise that right, yes. Your, your colleagues have all appreciated as we keep moving here today. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Regent Mara? I'm going to follow in the footsteps of my uh, fellow colleagues, Kenyanya and Shu. We are on our roll here. Yes, you are. Okay, thank Regent Powell. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman. I just have a quick question for President Gable. I know that she is um, in regular contact with legislative leaders. I'm not going to ask her for predictions, but if she could just give us maybe a little of comment, a bit of commentary on what she's hearing in terms of their inclination on, on, on bonding and the components of it. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. Regent Powell. Um, we are um, hearing a continued appetite for bonding, although we know that the subject has been one of public uh, debate in the last few days. Um, we're watching the governor's supplemental budget really closely uh, to see if there's any um, indicator or indices as a result of that. Um, and that would guide a lot of the summer decision making, but um, all indications are positive still for bonding, just reframed in light of the current circumstances. Great, thank you. Okay, let's see, uh, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just I'll put my usual pitch out there and, and tie this in with the last conversation that um, what, what we do operationally and, and we look at the different shifts in, in what's going on demographically in higher ed across the state, public and private, the role that we play, our commitment to serving a broad number, the largest number of, of resident students that we can, uh, those are the kinds of things that will be part of the calculus when legislators are deciding where to spend their scarce capital bonding capacity uh, as well as their uh, operational money. So uh, I think we need to continue to, to, to make the case that we're continuing to be the, the, uh, the institution of choice across our system uh, for, for Minnesota uh, students and that, that I think will, will serve us well as we're competing for, uh, for the support and the bonding. Thank you. Regent Simonson. No comment. Okay. Regent Swigum. Um, the state bonding bill will be the last bill out of the door next week. That's all I need to say. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to quibble with you about that. I think you're absolutely right. Regent Anderson. I concur with Regent Swigum, and that's uh, otherwise I'll pass. Okay. Regent Beeson. That's your question. What'd you say? I'm sorry, I missed that. No comment. Uh, no comments or no questions. Nothing. No comments or questions. Very good. Okay, and then on to our. Uh, student uh, representatives. I'll start with uh, Mr. Tojo Garcia here first. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. No question. Okay. And now before I miss, so in our, in our morning meeting, we had a, uh, we created a, a new title and then took it away again from, I mispronounced or misstating a title. Before I mispronounce your name again, student representative, uh, Batten, is it Batten or Batin or neither? 
Um, it's like it's batten, like batten down the hatches. Batten down the hatches. Got it. Thank you, Student <laughs> Representative Batten. Any questions, comments for us? That was my only comment. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, you know, create uh, create new names or titles for people here that aren't appropriate. Okay. Everyone's had an opportunity to speak. Any? Uh, I'm looking at my phone. Anything from no other speakers? Uh, Mr. Langworthy informs me. So we uh, will move on then to real estate transaction. Before the break, I think I erroneously stated that we had an action item there. We do not. The action item is the consent agenda today, but uh, the real estate items are here for our consideration and our review with action next month. So with that, I believe we're gonna go straight to Assistant Vice President Krieger, if she's here. I don't, uh, I'm sure you are but uh, I haven't looked to the other end of my my photos here I'm here Regent McMillan uh, chair McMillan members of the committee good afternoon our first real estate transaction before you today yeah, you are oh can you hear me go ahead sorry okay apologize uh, Regent McMillan members of the committee our first real estate transaction before you today is the proposed purchase of 1015 Essex Street, Southeast Minneapolis. As you noted, this item is for review only today with action in June. Before I provide an overview of the property and the proposed transaction, it is important to address the question as to why we're recommending such an investment at this time. First and foremost, our real estate strategy must balance the need to advance our mission and our strategic plan with the reality of our financial constraints. And this has become more important during these uncertain economic times. We are tracking and thinking about our acquisitions comprehensively, asking a series of questions related to both the strategic impact on the campus, as well as the financial implications. These questions include, how does this advance our strategic plan? Are there alternatives to this acquisition? Can we delay the acquisition? Does the property generate additional rental income to offset the carrying costs? Can we offset the acquisition with a comparable sale? What are the consequences, both financially and programmatically, to the university if this acquisition is not completed? In several cases over the past few months and weeks, there have been properties that have been marketed to the university that we have opted not to pursue because they do not stand up to the cost-benefit analysis of these questions. But in the case of 1015 Essex, we believe there is a strategic imperative for the university to move forward with this acquisition. And as a result, we are presenting it to you today for your consideration. The subject property is, oh, next slide, please. The subject property is situated on 1.32 acres of land. The property, known as Classic City Apartments, is located on a block that has been identified in the university's long range plans for a future clinical campus expansion. The northern portion of this block includes the Dinican Office Building's parking lot, which is part of the East Gateway Land Exchange approved by the board in February. The current use of the property consists of a 121 unit, five building apartment complex, plus the accessory parking lot. The university has been interested in this property for some time, but had not intended to pursue acquisition for a number of years. However, the seller put the property up for sale in late 2019, marketing it nationally to student housing developers. Given the size of the parcel and the city of Minneapolis's new land use designation of the property as Transit 30, which allows housing up to 30 stories in height, the university recognizes that if the property were to be purchased and redeveloped with a housing tower, it would preclude the university from ever realizing our plans for the block. Next slide, please. And here are just some additional photos of the interior and exterior of the property. Next slide, please. As we consider any real estate transaction, we always ask the question, what is the strategic value to the university? And in this case, this purchase supports the university's long-term plan for developing a clinical campus of the future. Advancing the standing and quality of the medical school and the health sciences to serve the state is and has consistently been a top priority for the university for the last several years. The university has completed district plans outlining necessary size and location for a fully developed clinical campus, which include the current CSC, the planned clinical research facility, and a longer term future hospital. Acquiring this property would allow for the future ownership of the entire block for the, by the university. Next slide, please. The current uh, owner and seller of the property is CPE Exchange 30537 LLC. The total purchase price for the subject property is $25 million, 
with $250,000 earnest money. The earnest money becomes non-refundable after June 15, 2020. As noted previously, the seller marketed the property to national student housing developers who are able to pay higher land costs as a result of the low vacancy rates around the university and high revenues generated by renting by the bed. The city's recently adopted new land use plan, which significantly increased the value of the property with its high density designation. And that being said, this purchase price does exceed the appraised value of $21.6 million. This purchase price was negotiated prior to the COVID-19 emergency in order to be competitive with the other offers received by the seller. And recently, the seller's broker has stated that despite the emergency, other parties do remain interested in the property. The closing will occur 30 days following the expiration of the university's inspection period, which ends approximately August 14, 2020. Next slide, please. We will be conducting a, con a facilities condition assessment and environmental assessments are actually underway as we speak to determine whether the level of deferred maintenance and any environmental concerns associated with the buildings. Upon receipt of these assessments, the university will determine whether the buildings can effectively be operated for student apartment rentals with a third party property manager, or whether the buildings have reached their useful life, life and should be demolished and used for additional surface parking lot until the time, um, until such time as the university redevelops the property. Our goal in this case would be to retain the property as a lower cost student housing, um, but that will be determined by the due diligence. And this concludes my summary of this proposed transaction. And I understand that I will now present the second real estate transaction prior to the region's discussion. Next slide, please. This real estate transaction is also for review with action in June. And this is the proposed sale of 435 acres at Newmore Park for, re resident, for residential development. For those of you who have been on the board since 2018, this transaction will look familiar. The university offered this property for sale for residential development through an RFP in September 2017. The proposal from Newland land acquisition was selected and the university negotiated and signed a purchase agreement with Newland in June of 2018 for $13.1 million. You may recall that Newland terminated this agreement in September of 2019 following challenges with its financial capital partner. The university was approached later in the fall by Maplewood Development and Construction, a Minnesota corporation, who offered to purchase the property on essentially the same terms as the previously negotiated purchase and sale agreement. Maplewood has a long-standing history in Minnesota, and its entities have developed over 5,000 commercial and residential lots across the Twin Cities area, including a 120-acre mixed-use site in Maple Grove, and, recently, and a recently completed development of over 250 acres in Woodbury. As of 2020, Maplewood has nearly 2,500 additional lots and units in their pipeline, including the development of the former 3M Imation site, which is, over, uh, which is a 200-acre master plan community in Oakdale. Next slide, please. The property is currently used by CFANS for agricultural production and research, and the final acreage to be sold will be determined prior to as a result of the development planning for final location and alignment of the primary roadways. So for example, the alignment of Akron Avenue and Boulder Trail may shift from what was originally planned in the initial RFP, and these possible realignments could result in additional acreage or reduced acreage for the transaction. The purchase and sale agreement would be amended accordingly. Next slide, please. Again, we ask the question, what is the strategic value to the university in selling this property? As you may recall, in February 2015, the Board of Regents approved a resolution related to the reorganization of Umar Park development process that included maximizing financial return to the university by selling land through public processes at competitive prices benchmarked to market rates. This sale is consistent with that resolution and compatible, compatible with the vision for Umar Park becoming a vibrant market-driven community for residents and businesses, reflective of private sector demand and in alignment with adjacent community needs and standards to be advanced by the university. The net proceeds derived from this land sale will be deposited into the Umar Park Legacy Fund as directed by the Board of Regents in 2009. Next slide, please. And again, for the transaction overview, 
the terms of this transaction are nearly identical to that which the Newland transaction, to that of the Newland transaction, which was approved by the board in 2018. The Newland purchase and sale agreement served as our starting point, and we were able to retain the key terms of that agreement. Maplewood Construction will pay $13.1 million cash at closing, and this is consistent with the two independent appraisals that were conducted at the time of the original RFP. Maplewood will deposit $50,000 in earnest money within five days of signing of the purchase agreement, and then we'll deposit an additional $250,000 of earnest money at the end of the 180-day due diligence period. Maplewood then has up to two years from the end of the due diligence period to obtain the municipal approvals and permits prior to closing. Next slide, please. Maplewood will be solely responsible for the cost of all infrastructure and utilities necessary for development within the boundaries of the property, and they are required to be, they are required to facilitate the cost sharing arrangements with the city, county, and other governmental units for the cost of the regional property infrastructure that will serve both the property and the broader Umar Park area. The university has also developed a declaration of covenants and design guidelines that are included as part of the purchase agreement to ensure that the development of the property will reflect the goals of the university for high quality development, which will then retain our property values for the future development of Umar Park. As with the original purchase agreement with Newland, the university will be required to locate the university's Turkey Research Facility, which is located outside of the property boundaries, but nearby the property boundary, outside of the property boundaries, but nearby, and that has to occur within five years after the closing date. And finally, the purchase and sale agreement does include a new provision that was not part of the original Newland agreement. This provision limits the university's ability to market the portion of the property that's shown on this map in the green hatch marks solely for residential development for a period of two years after the closing in order to allow the buyer to effectively market their lots. The Newland agreement included a right of first negotiation in that same area, but it was a slightly different take on that protection of their interests. And with that, I conclude my summary of this proposed transaction and stand for questions. Thank you, Vice President Krieger. Nice job walking through those two items. I'm going to go straight to the regents here and see if people have comments or questions. Moving down our list, it's Regent Herr's turn to go first, and I'll start with her. I don't have any. Mr. Chair, I'll pass. Okay. Regent Hsu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'm supportive of these transactions. I do have a question on the Umar Park property, and that is if you can put up that picture again. So I'm trying to understand. When we built TCF Stadium, we traded land to the state. Has that land been given to the state already? And if so, where is it? Regent McMillan, Chair McMillan, Regent Hsu, if you look at this map and you see the area entitled Vermilion Highlands, that is the area that is slated for future state acquisition, and that will occur at a later point in time, and I don't recall the date offhand, but I can certainly get that to you. It's several years out. And in the meantime, it is managed by a joint committee of the state and the university called the Vermilion Highlands Steering Committee. And so any land use decisions or issues that arise related to the Vermilion Highlands are jointly agreed to at this point in time between the state and the university as voting members, and then there are other members of the committee that include Dakota County, Empire Township, and others. And Mr. Chair, if I can put in Regent Hsu, it's my understanding that the agreement to fund TCF was that when the bonds are paid off for TCF, the title would transfer to the state DNR on Vermilion Highlands, but only when the stadium was paid off. Okay. Thank you. So basically then there's not much property left at Umar Park 
it's just that middle part kind of above the red line and then underneath the um, the green hash marks is that right Chair McMillan, Regent Shu. So if you, as you note in this map here, the uh, aggregate mining lease area is under control, uh, is the area that is being leased to Dakota aggregates. And the university continues to utilize the property that is not under active mining for uh, purposes of research and agricultural production. Uh, the, as the active mining areas are completed, <coughs> excuse me, are completed and, <coughs> excuse me. As the active mining areas are completed and are, the land is reclaimed, that land then gets turned back over to the university. And so we reclaimed, for example, last year, we reclaimed about 30 additional acres and now that is back under agricultural use. The area in terms of the limited, the area in the green hash marks, which would be limited uh, for residential marketing area under this agreement, that does not preclude the university from limit from uh, marketing that for uh, commercial or industrial purposes. And so if you think about that area in between DCTC and the OPUS agreement area, that is an area that we're considering for uh, commercial and industrial, light industrial development and so would not be subject to this uh, uh, limitations uh, related to the sale of this re for residential, if that makes sense. Uh, and then you're correct, then the area south of Highway 46 is not under any uh, limitations. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Thanks for asking those questions, Regent Shu. that is helpful, it's easy to lose track of what's going on on this sizable piece of property to our uh, ourselves, so I appreciate that as well. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, AVP Krieger. My questions are also about you, Moore Park, and um, you alluded to it earlier, obviously there's been action on the four, um, so maybe some of us newer to the board just don't have that context. So my questions are around, um, you know, you mentioned that that the, any sort of transaction has to be in line with the vision for you, Moore Park. Um, if you could touch on what that vision is and who's it, is it? Is it the universities or the cities? Um, and then uh, that the proceeds, the proceeds go to the Umor Park Legacy Fund. And if you could uh, address what, um, what those funds would then be used for in the future or their purpose. Chair McMillan, Regent Kenyanya, I'll start this, uh, this response and I might have to phone a friend in some of these, a number of these, uh, actions by the Board of Regents occurred prior to me being in this current role of Assistant Vice President for Planning Space and Real Estate. But sure. Umore Park has a long history in terms of the university's vision for how this area should be redeveloped. And um, I can certainly provide you, I think it'd be helpful maybe for all of the regents who are relatively new to the board uh, to receive some of those previous docket materials that go into a little bit more history uh, about Umore Park and um, uh, the, the vision and where we, where we were and where we are today. And so in the um, mid, in the early 2000s or uh, uh, prior to 2015, the university had the vision that we were going to become a master developer for the property and that we would actually do play that development role. And there was a Umore Park LLC formed to actually play that developer role. In 2015, the board decided to take a little bit different approach and disband that LLC and to really decide, decided that this really needed to be a more market-based approach where the university would sell the land and then, but be still be subject to some of these design guidelines and uh, covenants that, the, that really protect the university's interests long-term. And so working with the city, uh, we, we did, the city does have an AUAR, an alternative urban area uh, wide review plan for this uh, for the area that really calls out the long term land use plan for the area and this is consistent with that long term land use plan. And so we do work closely with the city of uh, Rosemount on this and we have been lockstep with the city in terms of uh, this sale of this 435 acres they were really disappointed when 
uh, when the Newland transaction fell through last year and are uh, excited that we have a new developer uh, for this. And so then the, this, uh, the developer will have to go through the city's uh, development review process and uh, zoning review process, as well as meeting our uh, design guidelines. And if I can jump in, Regent Kenyanya and members, um, the Viewmore Legacy Fund is a region created fund for when property sales of this property, it's directed by the regions to uh, help the programmatic elements. It's uh, We can get you copies of that, but um, it doesn't just go into a real estate account somewhere. There's actually designated by the board when we do these property sales. The other complication here is this land came to the university around 1948 at the end of World War II and includes what was called then Gopher Ordinance Works and members of the litigation review committee of the board know that there's challenges there with cleanup from work that was done on smokeless um, gunpowder to during a war effort that um, uh, the federal government and a contractor left in place that we're still dealing with. So it's a very complex piece of property, but the goal has been for the board to monetize it and put as much into the you more legacy art. The goal has been to monetize as much as possible that doesn't impact the research that's gone on down there, much of it agricultural in 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 uh in sea fans i'm going to uh, jump in here and uh, regent beeson has signaled that um he may have some help here for this is what is becoming a umore park education opportunity so um he's raised his hand and i'm going to ask uh, ask him if he's got more to bear on or something to add that bears on uh, regent kenyanya's background question uh, thank you mr chair the the um you know, the project was commenced about uh, a dozen years ago, and it was a different world. Um, and as uh, Assistant Vice President Krieger said, we were to play the role of master developer. And with the uh, advent of the Great Recession, uh, that very quickly sort of transformed the project into more of a practical market rate um, uh, selling off parcels. I would encourage all of you to get down there and get a tour. Is visually, it's really, the, it's much larger than it appears uh, on a map. The proceeds, the, those are net proceeds after we've paid expenses. At one point, we had incurred up to, I think, $9 million of costs, tremendous planning costs, engineering costs, environmental costs. And once those costs are reimbursed, then the, it's the net proceeds go into this legacy fund for for um, students. They, I'm glad to hear Maplewood is looking at this and wants to move forward. This is gonna be a fabulous housing site. The excavation next door by, by um, the, the mining companies are gonna leave a lake the size of Lake Calhoun. So there's gonna be an amenity that's gonna be pretty stunning for those people that decide to live down there. Um, I would also point out, I think, um, Correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's even after the abandonment of the turkey research, there is still some agricultural research that will remain on the site on one of those parcels. So we will have some presence down there uh, over a period of time. And finally, the stadium, the, the deeding does happen once the state fulfills its obligation. They're paying us annually through an appropriation for the stadium. But once that's concluded, then they'll get title as Mr. Burnett indicated. Thank you. Um, I'll just also add at this point, I think that uh, given transition on the board and the length that this has been around, if uh, the administration would put together a packet of prior docket materials, some for a little bit, perhaps going back to the stuff Regent Beeson just referenced, but more importantly, the, the pivot that occurred in the abandonment of that original vision onto what we have today, that'd be really good between now and the June meeting, so. We'll get that for you, sir. Okay, Regent Mayor on. Thank you. The questions I had had to do with the UMOR transaction and they have been answered by the previous uh, questions and answers. Very good, thank you, Regent Powell. Uh, thanks, Chair McMillan. I, I, my question is on uh, uh, 1015 Essex. 
Um, uh, I, I support purchasing that property uh, and I also support the sale of the Umore land. But my question has to do with the, the high density designation by the city. And I know that this is now ancient history, but I'm just interested in learning from it. I guess my question is, you know, how did that happen and when um, you know, particularly for a property that is, you know, so clearly a strategic priority for us. Um, that wasn't a good day for us when it, when that designation was was given. And so I'm just wondering if there's any learning for us in this whole process, what kind of influence we have uh, on those decisions. And so any background that you can give us on uh, the, de the high density designation. Chair McMillan, Regent Powell, the uh, city of Minneapolis was engaged in over the last 18 months or so in the updating of its comprehensive land use plan. And the um, university did participate in terms of providing comments to the city of Minneapolis on that plan. Uh, I do not recall offhand whether we specifically identified that part this particular parcel when we were doing comp um, comments, so I would have to go back and look at that. But we did provide overarching comments on the plan and particularly in the areas around uh, the Minneapolis campus. And uh, the plan was adopted by the city of Minneapolis there uh, in January of this past year, in January of 2020. And uh, you'll recall that you may recall that there was quite a bit of conversation among the public uh, in the public realm around this uh, land use plan because of the city's desire overall to increase the density uh, in the city. And so that plays out in a number of different ways in the uh, lowest density residential areas by allowing for uh, additional units on even single family lots all the way up to identifying these areas across the city where that are in uh, on transit lines as much higher density. So this area went from an R6 uh, residential zoning and is now going to be zoned, up zoned, uh, that has this additional res uh, des density designation that allows for instead of, you know, six to 10 story apartment buildings, you're now up to, uh, you know, 10 at a minimum of 10 and up to 30 with even higher if, uh, if they seek a, a, a variance from that 30. So it really does increase uh, the density and increases a, develop, a student housing developer's ability to add more units to the site and increase their ability to uh, gain revenues from a, a specific size parcel. So it really okay. did increase the value of this property significantly and the seller recognized that and uh, marketed and uh, hired a firm out of Chicago to actually market this to national student housing developers. Okay, it's good background, thank you. Thank you, Regent Powell. In my haste to move along, I may have uh, blown right past uh, a follow-up from Regent Kenyanya. I wanna stop before I go to Regent Rocha and make sure I did not skip something else you wanted to say. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. It, I, I, just, I was just briefly clarifying um, um, I appreciated the comments, by the way, from AVP Krieger and our historian and resident, Regent Beeson. Um, <laughs> they were helpful. But I just wanted to clarify on, so my understanding is that the use of the legacy funds are, are for the academic and research activities happening elsewhere on Umore Park, correct? No. Is there an identified use? It's a quasi endowment region, Kenyan, and we'll put that in the, what the use is for because the board was specific about that. It has board guidance on it. We'll put that in the information to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, now uh, Regent Rosha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to touch on the, we talked about Essex, you know, back into that area. Um, I'm, I'm supportive of, of these acquisitions. I think. Um, you know, consistent with my principle that being landlocked as we are, um, when we have opportunities to acquire, you know, up to a certain uh, point, I suppose, ec economically, we, we should always take, take those opportunities when we have these these types of plans. I do have a couple of, of, of uh, questions. I have an observation and then a question. Uh, the observation, I, I, I'll be very interested to see what the city does on this density concept. Um, there are other areas outside of, of the downtown area that have not gone up. They have developed, uh, warehouse district being one in particular, but with the, the COVID-19 pandemic in, in areas that have 
work very hard on, on you know, uh, increasing density. They've been affected particularly um, uh, 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 hard in, in that respect. And so I think that we, we may have some conversations about uh, whether that's going to continue uh, down that path. I know that has been the, the, the model that's been followed, but uh, I think most people recognize that, that the COVID-19 is not the last time we will see a situation like this. And so you might actually see a, a, a preference for adding some more space. Um, and that's something that I think would serve our university well as well. Um, that being said, so understanding on Essex, I, I understood that we uh, uh, are paying a, a, something in the range of $4 million, EVP Kruger, about $4 million over what the appraised value on the property was. Is that accurate? The three points, uh, three point four million, correct? Okay, and 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 so, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I'm 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 just I want to make sure that I'm tracking. So, you know, we 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 have a position that we don't bank a property that there that there's a there's a an intended use, um, and but I want to make sure because because for us to be paying more than market, um, have we did we discuss the prospect of eminent domain on the property, um, because. Obviously, to, to exercise that authority, you have to have a plan. And if we're not banking, that means we have to have a plan. So that would, means we would have to have a plan for this property. And so, or did we just decide that the $3.4 million premium was worth spending as opposed to the market rate, um, which at least theoretically would be what we'd be paying if we, if we exercised our uh, uh, authority granted by the state? Chair McMillan, Regent Rosha, I um, I won't get into the eminent domain issues, but I will speak a little bit more about the how we arrived at that purchase price. Uh, as as you noted the uh, and as I noted in my presentation, the appraised value for the property is twenty one point six million dollars, and uh, we arrived at and through the negotiations with the seller arrived at the twenty five million based upon the uh, broker's uh, um, statements related to that they had other uh, interested parties that were willing to pay more than $25 million for this property. And so um, the university's $25 million offer uh, won out because we do not have the same contingencies that some of the other uh, entities might have related to being subject to city uh, reviews and approvals and development reviews and approvals. Uh, and so our offer was selected, but uh, according to the broker there, they in back and forth negotiations, there were other mm -hmm. offers that exceeded the $25 million. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I just simply say that, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, of using eminent domain. I, I much prefer to have a negotiated uh, result. It, it is unusual for um, for us, I, in my experience anyway, that to be paying you know above market rate. Um, but obviously, these are unusual times, and and I'm I'm not entirely convinced that there hasn't been a shift to in our in our favor based on what's happening with demand and even enrollment numbers and so on. But I got a few more sort of technical questions, but I can do those offline since this is only for information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, Regent Simonson. I pass. Okay, Regent Swigum. <laughs> Yeah, Chairman McMillan, I'm just uh, wondering if uh, our former friend and our former regent, Dean Johnson, was part of uh, the negotiating team with you, Ms. Kruger, because he's been trying to get that turkey research facility out in Candy, Ohio County for a long time. <laughs> it, regent Swigum, I had exactly the same thought when I saw turkey research. I thought, you want to get that moved soon, so... No comments. Yeah, Dean is involved somehow. <laughs> uh, Regent no McMillan, Regent Spigum, uh, the <laughs> provisions related to the Turkey research, moving the Turkey research farm were included in the original Newland purchase agreement that was uh, before my time. Let, let's say I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm uh, just kidding. <laughs> we heard a lot about turkeys from our former colleagues, so neither of us could help. But uh, anyway, anything else, Regent Spigum? No. Regent Anderson. I've learned a lot in the discussion, but I don't need to ask any questions. I do support both transactions. Okay. Regent uh, Beeson, anything else uh, from your prior to add to your prior comment about Umore or Essex? No, I'll pass. Okay. 
Regent Davenport, you close the Regents and I'll check in with our student reps and we'll move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just looking for a confirmation that there was a discussion along the lines with DCTC or Minnesota State about that land as we talked about last year. Vice President Krieger. Regent McMillan, Regent Davenport, I did approach uh, the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities related to their real estate per person related to this and whether or not they had any interest. I would expect that we'll continue to have ongoing conversations with them, just as we are with the school district down there about potential for additional public uses. Thank you. Okay, any uh, comments from uh, um, student representative Batten or Tojo Garcia? Uh, thank None you, at Chair. this time for me. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. I wanted to ask quickly, um, uh, given that the property in question, Rosemount, is adjacent to the Rosemount Research and Outreach Center, has the university conducted some sort of assessment of how development in that area would impact the work that is done uh, there? Regent Vice Mc President Krieger. Regent McMillan, uh, student representative Tojo Garcia. Uh, the Rosemount Research and Outreach Center has a, operates both a mix of research and uh, production crops there that then help fund their research. And so we have a detailed map of where the research is, where the research plots are versus where the production crops are and work closely with the research, the Rosemount Research and Outreach Center and CFANS on, on the long-term future. And in terms of uh, when we developed this originally, the 435 acre boundaries in terms of understanding what research might be impacted and how they might move that research uh, long-term to to other parts of the property or to other research and outreach centers. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it. Good. Okay. We're going to uh, wrap up conversation. Uh, any other speakers or interested regents? Mr. Langworthy? Don't there, see any. There are not, Chair McMillan. All right. And we're on to our item of business now, the consent report changing gears here. We're not going to go through the full board, um, you know, alphabetically. Uh, this item is, is for action today. And if you're interested in, one, asking a question about anything, or two, um, ask, ask a, a comment, or I guess three, if you would like anything separated and acted on independently, please notify Mr. Langworthy now. And, uh, and then I'm going to ask Senior Vice President Burnett to give us a high level summary of what's in the consent report. You've all had the materials for a while now, so you know, but I'd like him to summarize it. And then uh, Mr. Langworthy can uh, assemble a list of, of anybody with questions, comments, or a request to separate. Uh, Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Quickly through this, there's a number of things that have been added and want to remind our regions that we did add some supplemental things in the supplemental upload through the board office to make sure you have the current list. We do not have any general contingency, um, but we do have many goods and services, really a lot of IT licensing that's keeping this university going today on the economic or the educational enterprise. Um, all these were done with uh, RFPs or competitive processes, UNIS in there. I want to highlight the two on the on page 218 around U.S. Bank and Wells Fargo and call out the work of Associate Vice President Volna and Associate Vice President Mason and their teams. It was the first time in university history that we put our banking services out to bid. Um, we got 13 banks interested, professionals from HR, IT, um, and not only did we keep our two banks, uh, Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank, for all the big banking needs around the world that the university has, but we will save the university 531,000 annually, or almost 3.2 million over the six-year life of the contract. And that's just tremendous work to get at or better service for about a half a million dollars less. And um, I just wanted to call that out. We do have a amendments to the retirement plan required by the CARES Act, and that came up at a recent meeting. And then um, 
the faculty retirement plan has a lot of different things we have to talk about. And then we do have two items um, about course fee refunds for spring of 2020, some information um, about that on pages 222 and 223. And then the revised consent report on page 225 talks about the university's principles for allocating the Federal CARES Act funds for student assistance, which total about 17.7 million across the five campuses. And um, we're, we would like the board to bless those principles because we would like to get that money uh, taken down through Garnstock.gov, brought to the university and get it in our students' hands um, within the next week to 10 days. So we, we would like your blessing on those principles and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Senior Vice President Burnett. Just to clarify, I, I don't see any speakers showing up and no request to handle anything independently, but I wanna clarify the CARES Act principles relate only to money to go to students. So the half of the money that goes there, not relative to the, uh, the uh, recent communication we got from general counsel about that and the money that we, we may accept at a later date as a university, is that correct? That's correct, sir. This is the 50% the minimum that has to go to the students. Yes, sir. Good. Well, there's a lot of 18s floating around because that happened to be the number that uh, I think uh, the dean of the medical school ended up with from the, uh, the state to help with testing too. So we've got 18 potentially for the university, 18 for the university students and, uh, and 18 to do COVID testing. So a lot of 18s. We'll, okay. take all of them, we'll take all of them helping our budget situation, sir. Indeed. And that of our students. I do see a uh, speaker now. Uh, Regent Shu, question, comment, or a request to separate? CARES Act uh, from the others, please. You'd like to separate the CARES Act from the others. That's fine. We don't yeah. need, Mr. Langworthy, we don't need any procedural action. We just separate it, correct? That is correct, Chair McMillan, but Regent Shu, can you clarify, this is the, the CARES Act, the student fees item you would like separated because there's also amendments to the faculty retirement plan. Yeah, the student, the student part. Thank you. Okay. So let's see here, make sure I can do this right. Any, um, we'll, we'll take comments then and questions on the CARES Act student delivered money when we handle that separately. I would entertain a motion from a member of the board to consider and move on the remaining items, everything but the CARES Act student money uh, piece at this time. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda minus the item that Regent Chu asked to have removed. Discussion on the consent agenda in its near entirety. Hearing none, all in favor. Oh, do we need to do a roll call vote, Mr. Langworthy? We do, Chair McMillan. Thank you. I was moving really quick there as five o'clock approaches. Will you please take the roll? On the motion to recommend approval of the consent report with the exception of the CARES Act funds for student assistance. Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Her. Yes. Regent Her votes yes. Regent Chu. Yes. Regent Chu votes yes. Regent Kinyanya. Yes. Regent Kinyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair McMillan. Yes. Chair McMillan votes yes. There are 12 yeses and zero noes. Thank you. There being uh, 12 yeses and zero noes to approve the consent agenda minus the uh, student uh, cares element. 
That matter carries. I don't think Regent Anderson sent the gavel over from Alexandria today. So I'll just pound on the table minus his gavel. And we will now take up the remaining matter in the consent agenda. And I would turn back to uh, Regent Shu to see if he has uh, any comment or anything, how he'd like to frame his request to, uh, the, it's been moved out now. Do you have anything else you wanna say before we before we might act on that? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I just kinda wanna understand uh, how these were constructed and whether they're all identical. I haven't studied them enough to know if there's any um, differences between the different campuses other than the prices, the dollars. President Gable, could you direct us to which member of your team might answer this, or if you want to? Uh, I would uh, defer to Senior Vice President Burnett, please. Okay, that's what I thought, but I wanted to be sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a little bit of background. I know it's getting late. The University of Minnesota was notified by the U.S. Department of Education that financial assistance under the recently re enacted CARES Act is available to students and the campuses of public and private institutions, including the University of Minnesota, and the president, in consultation with the provost and our four chancellors, have developed a set of principles consistent with the Department of Education's compliance requirements to apply to awarding of these one-time federally funded student aid funds. These principles are noted on page 225 of the docket. And I can tell you that um, you know the guidance has been um, broad, but there's been a, a lot of work done across the campuses to get this um, as fair, as, as consistent in the student's hands as possible. I will say though, uh, there are, are provisions and um, the board was notified under separate cover that there's some requirements under the federal law around our maintenance of our um, employment of contractors and employees to the extent practicable um, with all the CARES Act funds. And so I just wanna just put that in the, um, for the, the board's note that you were notified separately about just some of those implications with us accepting these dollars and that we have that um, in front of you as well. But this was a system-wide effort, Regent Shu, um, to be as consistent as possible. The allocations to each of the campuses were made based on each campus's share of Pell students and the number of Pell eligible students and those allocations by campus were set by the U.S. Department of Education. Thank you, Vice Senior Vice President Burnett. Uh, Regent Shu, anything else? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, so we received some information and then I believe, was there more guidance put out after we had received that information from, uh, from the federal government? Um, Regent McMillan, uh, Regent Shu, there seems to be guidance coming each day that there's more um, questions from the, the institutions across the country. As we print, put this together um, as a revised consent report, this is the guidance we have as of today is reported in this item for your consideration. Mr. Chair? Yes, Regent Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so how does how is this going to affect students have, who have graduated um, in the most recent spring or graduating in the most recent spring quarter or semester? Um, Mr. Chairman, I do not believe that students that are graduating are, are ineligible for this. I believe our financial aid offices are working on a plan about unmet need and to try and meet the spirit of this intent but we could get you more information even before tomorrow on that. But I do not believe graduating students were ineligible under this. So I, I think that um, it, 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 there's just a lot of work that the student financial aid folks have to do by campus on this. Okay, I, don't, I would appreciate uh, some more information by tomorrow, thank you. Um, let's see, I also have Regent uh, Anderson and before I ask for a motion and a second to move this, I guess if we've got additional information that regents want, Mr. Langworthy, is there, is it procedurally okay if we didn't act on this today and left it for tomorrow? The full board could act on it and pass it too, correct? Chair McMillan, the, the full board 
could take it up. The committee could forward it without recommendation uh, to the full board. Uh, you could offer it that this was considered without recommendation. That, that would be one option. Uh, the other option certainly is that uh, regions could vote now and could, uh, of course, change their, their votes at the full board level if there was additional information that uh, made them uh, want to do that. I think I'd prefer at this point, given that the committee and the board are one and the same, to hold off and not and, and let regents assess whatever additional information administration brings forward. And uh, with the board chair's permission, handle it that way tomorrow rather than take a vote today and then you know potentially have regents voting without all the information they want. So is it clear what information we need? And then I'm gonna turn to uh, to Regent Anderson, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, did that come through clearly so you know what you're looking for there or what the administration's gonna get? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we'll do our very best to give what, um, what we can before tomorrow. We'll get, right. it. we'll work with the uh, financial aid offices to get that for you. Okay, Regent Anderson. That, that was, thank you, Chair. That, that was somewhat my question because I was under the understanding that some schools have turned down this money simply for what they're tied to in the future. And I was wondering if we voted on this, you know, I, has the Minnesota, University of Minnesota, have we decided to accept the money before we vote on, if we're just voting on the principles of where it's going, I'm fine. But I'd also like to know what are the ramifications we have if we accept it. That, that's my, just my question. Regent Anderson, um, you just asked what I should have asked as a follow-up when I clarified with Senior Vice President Burnett that the principles here relate to the 18 million that passes through us to students. The other 18 million is what I think we have a bigger decision to make about is whether we want that money. But I'm now talking like a general counsel or something that I am not, so I better be careful and uh, maybe I don't know if Senior Vice President Burnett can clarify that or if we need General Counsel Peterson to weigh in. But I believe that's a second exactly issue. my question. If we could separate it, we'll get you an answer before tomorrow. Okay. If I'm not going to seek a second and a vote on this right now, then I think we could pick this up. Is there a consent agenda tomorrow, uh, Mr. Langworthy? There is, Chair McMillan, but this could also certainly be considered within the committee's report reporting that yes. the committee took no action and then the board could certainly take it up. That's a better approach. Thank you. Thank you. Don't mean to make up governance on the fly here, but I want to be sure we're, we're honoring, uh, you know, our process and the, uh, the public nature of this. So rather than bring a committee action to the board for ratification tomorrow, we'll bring the full consent agenda other than this uh, with action on it. And that will come with no recommendation for action tomorrow. Did I state that right? Yes, Chair McMillan. Okay. All right. Um, we've acted on most of the consent agenda at this point. There's some additional information regents can look for tonight. On the last item in the consent agenda, item six before us is our information items in the spirit of time. I'm not gonna call on the administration. I, I was I'm not gonna call on um, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett to highlight these, but I am gonna make the following comment. There is a lot in your information items, enormously important and, and impactful things, especially in the space of um, the human resource analytics, the compensation data analytics overview, the, uh, you know, the faculty pay and uh, all, all classes of employee compa ratios. I, I commend that to your reading. We will find time in June to do uh, appropriate justice to this. And uh, also today, I, I alluded to this in my comments about and during the budget conversation, our investment uh, team has done marvelous work and uh, put us in a, in a very enviable position with our peers. And uh, we probably need to do some kind of better recognition of that. That's before you as is the uh, committee that uh, Vice Chair Beeson sits on, which is the Investment Advisory Committee. And again, a ton of info in there, faculty retirement plan and uh, asset management reports. So 
lots in there and uh, I don't want anybody to think we don't know about that or that we would quote drive by close quote that important stuff it's there but I'm going to move us through to closure here before we get too far beyond uh, the five o'clock hour Chair, knowing Chair. We've got another day of governance tomorrow Mr. Chair Langworthy McMillan. Chair McMillan Mr. Langworthy yes uh, General Counsel Peterson is signaling ah on the uh, CARES Act perhaps Yes, Chair McMillan. Um, I appreciate the hour is late, but because people will be thinking about this overnight and because there are a couple of questions here that, <clears throat> you know, suggest some additional clarity might be helpful, at least as a preliminary matter, and we can follow up additionally tomorrow. But I want to be clear, first off, that the, the employment proviso, I will call it, the proviso of the CARE Act, CARES Act that says that accepting the money means that you are certifying that you will continue to pay employees and contractors to the greatest extent practicable. That condition applies to accepting the student portion of the money as well as the institution portion of the money. Each um, pot of money, so to speak, carries the requirement of a certification. And on this issue, the warranty and certification that the university would make would be the same with regard to the student money that it would be for the institutional money. And so it is true that a decision to accept the money um, today would mean that you would need to take into account the CARES Act restrictions when you make the budget decisions that you make in June. And in terms of you know what's in the docket, it's true that you have sort of detailed descriptions of how the student money would be distributed. But as I understand it, it's contemplated that the university would like to take in the CARES Act money, you know, as soon as possible in order to get that money to students. So I believe it is contemplated that if you vote in favor of accepting um, those ways of distributing money that the university is also contemplating that you are authorizing the university to accept the CARES money and you would be authorizing administration to sign the certifications that would go to the federal government, which is a predicate to the federal government supplying the money that would in turn go to students. So uh, I just want you to have that in mind. We can talk some more about it tomorrow, but I wanna make sure you're not at sea over that point as you're thinking this through overnight. So I apologize for taking up some time, but I thought it was important for you to have no, that, security. That's much appreciated, General Counsel Peterson. That gets right to the heart of the question that, uh, that Regent Anderson raised and, and that I erroneously was trying to bifurcate. We can't bifurcate the money and take and have a certification on one half and not on the other. Okay, um, so that's understood. Let me ask you this procedural question and then our board chair wants to speak as well. Um, could we approve principles but still not have authorized acceptance of the money. I got to look at the docket materials closer. I thought I poured mm -hmm. over everything here, but I'm missing that point. You say that this is, or you're suggesting that if we approve the principles, we're also approving administration going forward and signing. Well, Chair McMillan, certainly the board has the ability to um, act in, in whatever way it wishes. I mean, if you want to separate out one from the other, you certainly can do that, but you need to appreciate that students will not receive the money until we Got submit it. the certification. So, um, you know, it, it's certainly possible for the board to approve the distribution principles and just wait in the hopes that the money's still available and that, um, you know, you, that you'd want to make a certification decision when you sort of understand the full budget ramifications you have to consider in June, but, I think the, the concern is that um, during that period of delay, students wouldn't benefit from the money. And then in addition, we just wanna make sure that federal government pot doesn't run dry. Um, and that also is a kind of an undefined worry as I understand it, but it's certainly a worry. Okay, before I turn to our board chair, um, who's got a, a question or perhaps clarity to bring to this, I would just ask that the president and the senior team um, huddle on this and hopefully bring some clarity tomorrow before we, we act on it in terms of 
the principles and the implications for approval if we approve the principles, knowing what General Counsel Peterson just said, which is the longer we wait to approve, the longer the students are from getting any money and the potential they don't get any if the pot runs dry. So um, Regent Powell. I was gonna ask if we could bifurcate the money and General Counsel Peterson anticipated the question, so I'm good. Okay, is uh, President Gable, uh, is, it, is, our, is the board's interest here something you can uh, perhaps coalesce around tonight and help us so we uh, make uh, more effective and helpful decisions tomorrow? Absolutely, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. That being the last item before us, I am going to uh, adjourn the Finance and Operations Committee and we'll see everybody tomorrow morning for the full board. We stand adjourned. Dave, are you still on? Yep, I'm on. <laughs>